going to start now. Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you from India Rights Network. We have a fantastic audience on this morning from all over the world. Happy Africa Day and Eid Mubarak greetings. My name is Manish Chang. I am founder and CEO of India Rights Network and India and the World magazine. I am delighted to see so many friends and Africanists from across time zones and geographies in the world, from Paris, London, and Glasgow to Johannesburg, Nairobi, Addis Ababa to Marrakesh. A spectacular a dream audience here. Can all of you hear me? Uh, am I clear to all of you? Yes, yes. 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 Okay. Uh, yes, so uh, uh, this is probably the first international webinar uh, focused on Africa, which is being hosted from India since the pandemic erupted three months ago. Without much ado, let me begin today's conference. Honorable uh, Mr. Rahul Chhabra, India High Commissioner to Kenya and Ambassador to Somalia, Dr. Anil Suklal, Deputy Director General, Director Deputy Director General, Durko, South Africa. His Excellency, Mr. Alam Mariam, Ambassador of Eritrea in India and Dean of African Group Heads of Mission in India. Her Excellency, Ambassador of Uganda to India, Grace Akilo. Her, His Excellency, Morocco's Ambassador to India, Muhammad Maliki. His Excellency, Ambassador, uh, Her Excellency, Ambassador of Ethiopia to India, Sita Mulugeta. His Excellency, Seko Kase, Ambassador of Mali, David Raskina, Managing Director, Exim Bank, Ambassador Virendra Gupta, Professor Rajan Hase, Pranav Kumar, Excellencies, Friends, Gentlemen and Ladies. A warm welcome to you once again. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you to this very important and timely conversation on the multifaceted India-Africa partnership in time of pandemic. I thank all speakers and participants who have found time with their numerous other engagements to join this webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, we have gathered at a rare moment in world history when the entire world is being ravaged by a microscopic microbe and we in India, Africa and the rest of the world are struggling to find various innovative ways to combat this killer pandemic and minimize death and devastation unleashed by it. Africa Day is celebrated across the world on May 25 to mark the foundation of the Organization of African Unity and a rising continent's liberation from the yoke of imperialism and colonialism. The theme for this year's celebration is silencing the guns, creating conducive conditions for Africa's development. Silencing the guns in Africa was reaffirmed as a flagship project of Africa's Agenda 2063. This year, the continent, like the rest of the world, will renew its pledge to liberate itself from the scourge of the coronavirus pandemic, which has cast a long shadow over the region and the world. India and Africa, which once walked hand in hand to combat colonialism and imperialism, have now joined hands to combat the pandemic. Dear friends, the pandemic may have interrupted the Africa growth story momentarily, but the medium and long-term prospects of the continent still look very bright. Similarly, India, the fastest growing major emerging economy, has suffered ravages of the pandemic, but its people and leaders have shown rare courage and vision to script, to script a new chapter in the country's development journey. Against this larger backdrop, we at India and the World magazine and India Rights Network think it is an appropriate moment to host a virtual conference on the Africa Day. The overarching theme of today's webinar is mapping next steps in India-Africa partnership, pandemic and beyond. As the theme suggests, the conference will focus on enhancing India-Africa cooperation in the immediate context of the pandemic and also in the post-COVID economic recovery. Taking a long range view, the virtual seminar will seek to map the future trajectory of the India-Africa partnership in accordance with 10 principles 
of the India-Africa partnership outlined by Prime Minister Narendra Modi in his visionary speech to the Ugandan parliament in July 2000, 2018. The discussions will explore how the India-Africa partnership can align with Africa's Agenda 2063, which crystallizes the continent's vision of its own resurgence. As Prime Minister Modi said, our development partnership will be guided by your priorities. It will be on terms that will be comfortable to you, that will liberate your potential and not constrain your future. At this stage, uh, let me very briefly speak about my organization. We at the India Rights Network and DGII Media launched India and the World magazine over two years ago in New Delhi with the overarching objective of providing an agenda-free narrative and perspective on global issues and developments from India's point of view. The magazine is published by TGII Media Private Limited. Our area, core areas of operations include media, publishing, research, consultancy, and advocacy. Eminent diplomats and experts are part of board of advisors for the magazine as well as our organization. Ladies and gentlemen, coming back to the pandemic, it has underscored the urgency of moving beyond polarizing agendas and to act in the spirit of oneness and solidarity. The spirit of oneness is beautifully evoked by young Nigerian poet, Sage Hassan. It's called One. Let me read out. Billions of people all struggling to fulfill seemingly different agenda, but we are all in pursuit of one collective destiny. We all need just one, one dream, one day, one hour, one minute, one second, one moment. Today, in the next nearly two hours, we hope to converse in the spirit of oneness and forge a blueprint for advancing India-Africa partnership in combating the pandemic, as well as in exploring the agenda for the fourth edition of India-Africa Summit, which is expected to be held in the next few months. Ladies and gentlemen, now let me introduce our keynote speaker. We've all been eagerly waiting to hear uh, Mr. Rahul Chabra speak. Mr. Chabra is currently India's High Commissioner to Kenya, Ambassador of India to Somalia, Permanent Representative of India to UNEP, Permanent Representative of India to UN Habitat, and Secretary Economic Relations Designate Minister of External Affairs. Earlier, he was Ambassador of India to Hungary and Bosnia and Herzegovina from August 2015 to October 2018. At headquarters, he worked as Joint Secretary, Central Europe, in the Ministry of External Affairs. He conceived and organized the first two editions of the India Central Europe Business Forum, which has now become a regular feature in the Indian business calendar. During this assignment, he was instrumental in focusing India's foreign policy towards Arctic and the V4. An alumnus of the prestigious St. Stephen's College, Delhi School of Economics, and Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, Mr. Chhabra worked tirelessly to promote foreign investment flows into India. If I go on reading Mr. Chhabra's resume, we'll spend quite a bit of time, so I'm going to cut that slightly, update it slightly. Uh, Mr. Chhabra is speaking to us from Nairobi, the Kenyan capital. I believe there's beautiful weather out there. What Mr. Chhabra says at this webinar will be watched closely in Africa and among those who follow India-Africa relations closely as he's set to take charge as Secretary ER in India's Ministry of External Affairs. In this crucial position, Mr. Chhabra will be in charge of Africa, will not only be in charge of Africa, but will also be India's Sherpa for BRICS and IPSA. He will also be in charge of India Development Partnership as well as Global Trade and Investment. With these words, I invite our keynote speaker, Mr. Rahul Chhabra, to address this audience. The floor is yours, Rahul. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Africa Day, Eid, Eid Mubarak. But uh, I thought uh, before I get on to the actual uh, course of the seminar, uh, just a little personal note in the interests of uh, full disclosure and complete transparency. Uh, Africa really has a very special place in my heart. Uh, what Manish uh, did not read out and was not part of uh, the bio 
is that uh, while serving in Dakar, Senegal, completely the other coast, I'm at the moment on the East Coast, but on the West Coast of Africa, over 30 years back, uh, both my sons were born in Dakar. So they are petty Dakarawas. So I really have a very special place for Africa in my heart. So on that note, uh, just uh, before we get to the uh, next steps, I thought we'll uh, sort of just uh, quickly to sort of put the context uh, right, uh, get talk about the current situations. Uh, that's how I'm planning to structure it. We'll go over the current situation in Africa, uh, India's role, how India intervened uh, over the last few months, and maybe we'll take it over the last three, four years. Uh, that'll be the second part. The third part uh, will be how it fits in with the AU Agenda 2063. And uh, we'll end with the fourth part, the next steps, and the motivation for the next steps. So we'll do it in uh, that format. Uh, so let's start with the current situation, of course. Uh, a national lockdown across uh, most of the continent, uh, where it has not been a national lockdown, like Kenya, it's a dust to dawn curfew. Uh, so all the same, devastating impact on the economy, loss of income, fear of contagion, heightened uncertainty. I mean, you know the effects, so I don't want to go over it. Uh, but what we need to keep in mind is that it will have huge economic, social, technological, geopolitical impact uh, globally, but more so on this continent, uh, Africa. So uh, we need to prepare for that. Uh, most of the countries are LDC countries with very high public debt, high budget deficit, uh, about 6%, leading to balance of payment strains. Uh, just uh, to tell you that this pandemic here is particularly in Kenya has come uh, after they just uh, suffered the ravages of drought. Uh, they were in the middle of floods and a locust invasion. So uh, on top of that, the pandemic has uh, sort of come. So it's not really been a moment when the economy was really ticking along in that sense. Uh, the forecast for the African economy, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, is a decline of 2.1 to 5.1%. Uh, that, just to put it in quantitative terms, uh, a decline of $37 billion to $79 billion is the uh, forecast. Last year, uh, this part, the Sub-Saharan Africa grew by 2.4%. Uh, of course, this is also uh, going to be exacerbated with the decline in international commodity prices. The demand for exports are going down. Foreign exchange reserves are going to be under great strain. Uh, the response, AU has set up a COVID response fund. $12.5 million from the bureau members of the AU, $4.5 million for the Africa Center for Disease Control, so those sort of measures will be coming. Uh, but where India sort of begins to step in is the G20 meeting, which Prime Minister attended uh, virtually. And uh, sort of that call for a comprehensive stimulus package uh, has been well received uh, by India. Uh, deferred payments, they asked for suspension of interest payments on external public and private debt. Uh, and no, there was a request from the AU that not to suspend medical supplies. So that sort of the, puts the context of where we are today. Uh, coming to how uh, India responded immediately, uh, Prime Minister spoke uh, telephonically, as many of you may be aware, to the President of South Africa, the chair of the AU. He spoke to the heads of state, heads of government of Uganda, Ethiopia. So he spoke to several African leaders. Uh, that was also... Uh, followed up by External Affairs Minister Dr. Jay Shankar, who uh, spoke to several foreign ministers, including the Kenyan uh, foreign minister. Uh, you may be uh, wondering, I mean, just uh, speaking, I mean, uh, these are really very reassuring calls, at least the feedback I got from uh, Kenya, where I am currently. Uh, they felt extremely reassured after the discussions uh, with the top leadership. Uh, so these calls, of course, uh, many of us have been in this business for long. Uh, have an impact uh, which may not be completely evident uh, to the general public. Uh, coming to the second part of our response, uh, India is the pharmacy of the world. Uh, we've provided medicines to over 85 countries, but more importantly, 32 in Africa. Uh, 32 countries in Africa received uh, medicines and including uh, uh, drugs which were banned for export because India needed it internally, uh, but there were one-time waivers announced. 
uh, including hydroxychloroquine and all that. So uh, that was again a fallout of the talk between external Prime Minister Dr. Jay Shankar and CS uh, Rachel Omamo here in Kenya, but in other countries also. I don't have the details as of now. The third part was uh, the request uh, made at the G20 summit, the debt service uh, waiver. Uh, India has already got a request from five friendly African countries, and that will be looking at that's being looked at very positively. It's as per the IDA norms and the G20 uh, sheet, so that is also being looked at. Uh, going back a bit more uh, than the current situation uh, is the lines of credit offered by Exim, uh, which I don't want to get into too many details since we have Mr. Eskina here on the panel, uh, but uh, Africa is the second largest recipient of our overseas assistance, which include over 181 lines of credit, 41 countries get it. Uh, it's 42% of our overall uh, lines of credit, comprising $11 billion. Uh, but the critical part here is uh, we just finished a project a few months back, inaugurated by President Kenyatta here in Kenya. Uh, and that was a textile, the largest textile mill on the East African coast. Uh, what it's ended up doing is today, uh, producing hundreds and thousands of masks. So uh, though it was not meant to, uh, so the lines of credit are having these spin-off effects and uh, we are getting a lot of good mileage and good publicity where Rivertex is turning out these uh, masks. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, the bias credit that Exim Bank uh, gives over the last five years, over a billion dollars have been given out. While uh, talking about uh, Exim Bank's role just a little bit at the end, uh, uh, they've also helped set up six IT centers, seven vocational centers, entrepreneurship centers. So uh, we've been working on those fronts also. But uh, while I was telling you about Rivatex, it also reminds me of another incident that just happened a few weeks back here in the Kenyan context, where uh, Kenya requested for chlorine for water treatment. And uh, that was also facilitated. So it's not only drugs, uh, there's chlorine for water treatment. And as I mentioned, locusts. So the FAO wanted a uh, movement during the complete national lockdown in India, the first three weeks, uh, for pesticides to be moved out of India, and we were able to do that to facilitate. Uh, so India has been helping in not only uh, the direct uh, context where you hear about the drugs, but there are other important, very important uh, facets of our assistance. Uh, coming down to uh, the other longer term, what we've been doing is the duty-free, quota-free market access, which you're all aware of, is giving uh, access to uh, African exports. Uh, investment, we are, uh, with $54 billion, we are the third country, uh, third largest uh, investor here, uh, fifth largest investor, sorry, fifth largest investor here, but it is also facilitating African exports to third countries and intra-African trade, so in terms of investment. Uh, trade increased over tenfold uh, over the last uh, decade and a half, uh, two decades. It's declined with the end of the commodity super cycle. And it's now at about $70 billion, uh, still quite a substantial sum. There's a lot of scope for further growth. Uh, oil price declines have contributed to that uh, decline in the bilateral trade also. Uh, India is the third largest export destination in Africa. Then uh, coming to uh, the cultural outreach that we've done over the last few years to connect with Africa, 15 festivals of India over the last four years, uh, 12 for the first time. Uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Senegal, there have been uh, many countries where it's been for the first time. Uh, we are also looking at a festival of Africa in India. Uh, we are looking at ramping up the Distinguished Visitors Program. So that's uh, on track. Uh, the other part that I wanted to mention was the 50,000 scholarships over the last five years. Uh, we are very close to getting that figure through. So uh, lots of Africans coming in for India for training. Uh, we also have given over $600 million, it's close to $700 million of grant assistance. Uh, the last part uh, that sometimes gets ignored, uh, which I just wanted to highlight, of are these uh, links that have been going on uh, over the last, this is much more than the last few years. Now we're talking of generations. Uh, in Kenya, I can speak with authority, that's at least five generations, is the diaspora, uh, a really a living bridge. Uh, so the diaspora link uh, should never uh, be ignored in the African context. Uh, in terms of that, it leads me to the people-to-people -people connect, e-visas for 33 countries, uh, visa on arrival, uh, some of the African countries have already given visa on arrival to us, uh, air connectivity, over uh, eight uh, air carriers are connecting now directly 
uh, to India. Uh, so that is the broad uh, connect between India and Africa over the last uh, two years and maybe as I mentioned the diaspora. Uh, now coming into how it links with the AU agenda 2063, uh, the it really aligns with India's growth agenda. So that's a very good and a positive sign. Uh, we are looking at cooperation at the continental level, the regional level, uh, bilateral level. Uh, multilateral fora, also the IORA, the Indo-Pacific. So there's multiple fields where we connect. Uh, seriously looking at projects at the continental level. Uh, there are, there's cooperation in the health sector. 20% uh, of India's pharma exports go to Africa. Uh, Bhavatrons have been gifted everywhere, including in Kenya, uh, to several countries in Africa. And uh, the government really appreciates that, uh, by the way. Uh, we, every time we meet uh, people, we get a lot of credit for the Bhavatron that is being gifted. It's completely state-of-the-art, for those of you who may not be aware, a state-of-the-art uh, cancer detection uh, machine that is using nuclear and radioactive uh, sort of techniques. Uh, we are also seriously looking at joint ventures uh, hospitals are being set up as joint ventures here because the medical system here is weak. Uh, so that is again fitting in with the agenda 2063. Uh, looking at uh, collaborating with the Africa Center for Disease Control, uh, the Africa Medical Agency. In terms of uh, peace and security, uh, silence the guns, Manish spoke about that. Uh, Africa's standby force. Uh, in terms of uh, maritime security, uh, we are looking at uh, you know defense and security uh, there, there are new threats and transnational crimes, uh, which we'll be collaborating on. Uh, we've just gifted two naval vessels to Mozambique a few months back. Uh, India, after Congo in 1960, uh, today has reached uh, to be one of the largest contributors to the UN peacekeeping forces here, with over 5,000 uh, currently based in Africa in five different operations uh, going on. Uh, so in peace and security, we have a big uh, contribution. Uh, mapping of the continental shelf, uh, connectivity, climate change, extremism, counterterrorism. So these are all issues that sort of uh, fit in between uh, the agenda 2063 and India's uh, agenda. Uh, I come now quickly to the next steps. Uh, the uh, next steps and the new areas uh, which we could look at collaborating, they need, they need not necessarily be brand new in that sense, uh, but uh, just the new areas. Solar energy, where we need to ramp up. Uh, of course, uh, in the International Solar Alliance, as you're all aware, uh, more than half of the members uh, from Africa uh, have the membership over that. Uh, we have announced over $1.6 billion as line of credit uh, for African members for using, uh, for getting solar projects. Uh, the other aspect is bridging the digital divide. So how do you use technology to bridge the digital divide? Uh, in that, I wanted to bring again to your attention, just in the last few weeks, at least in Kenya, I have the figures, and Somalia, by the way, uh, the e ITEC program uh, that was launched. And uh, we've launched special programs, training on how uh, uh, COVID can be treated for uh, nurses, professionals, healthcare administrators. And over 50 uh, people have benefited already uh, in the last few weeks alone on the COVID programs through using this e -ITEC platform. Uh, it's done by the All Indian Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, it's backstopped by the IIT Madras. So it's really our premier institutes uh, that are involved in this e -ITEC program. Which leads me to the e Arogya and e Vidya Bharati more in the medium term uh, as the next steps, uh, which is in the second phase of imp implementation where over five years we are looking at training over 4,000 students over 1,000 medical professionals. Uh, so for five years, free training, uh, all on the digital platform. So that's the second aspect of the next steps. The third one is traditional medicines. So uh, it's, uh, it's an area where even Europe is uh, picking up fast. So I think uh, Africa should also uh, like our Ayush sort of uh, uh, alternatives uh, to, tradition, uh, to normal uh, conventional medicine. So we're looking at that. We're looking at the blue economy. Uh, Another very interesting part, uh, of course, the Blue Economy Conference was held in Nairobi uh, a year and a half back. Uh, so we're looking at building on that. Uh, there's also this other aspect of triangular cooperation that we're looking at. Uh, for example, France, we collaborated for the Solar Alliance. Uh, with the UAE, we're looking at Ethiopia to do a center for IT excellence. 
and in Japan, with Japan, we're looking at a cancer hospital here in India. So this concept of a triangular cooperation is also uh, one of the new aspects that we see ahead. There's also study in India. Uh, this is again, uh, I mean, many of you are aware that over uh, 13 current former heads of state, heads of government, vice president, just at this level, over 13 current and former uh, in Africa have studied in India. And uh, over half a dozen chiefs of army staff have again uh, studied in uh, India, including the current Kenyan chief of army staff. Uh, so uh, these are all very important links. And in fact, we have an association here called the Bharatwala Association, where students who studied in India and sort of get together. Uh, what's more interesting now is coming out and which needs to be actually promoted. Because India, I mean, to compare it to Africa, so rather uh, if each country, uh, one state focuses on it. So Gujarat, in fact, we had a delegation coming in from Gujarat and the sort of response they got, hundreds of students registered for universities in Gujarat in the space of a day and a half. And uh, some of them are getting scholarships, some of them are going to pay their own way. Uh, so we need, uh, so if we had all these uh, chiefs of army staff, 13 uh, current uh, former presidents uh, studying in India before the program was actually, uh, the study in India was launched, so you can imagine the impact proactive program will have. Another uh, sort of uh, aspect where we are looking at a new area is uh, women empowerment. Uh, so there are all these areas uh, which are the new areas that we could look at uh, as the next steps. Uh, as uh, Manish mentioned, uh, the Prime Minister's speech at Uganda, uh, which he said, uh, Africa, uh, we will work as per your priorities. Uh, the part that he didn't mention was the first part, uh, that Africa will remain on the top of our priorities. Uh, but building on what Manish mentioned about your priorities, of course, uh, cooperation being demand-driven, uh, consultative, participative, sustainable, and not a supply-driven uh, cooperation. So uh, I'll come now to the last part uh, of uh, what is it that is uh, pushing this uh, sort of uh, new uh, next steps. The first is the change in the politi political arena here. The Really, the democratic polity in Africa has taken root across so many countries. So there's a complete uh, mindset uh, change in Africa. So that is one of the drivers of uh, this collaboration. Uh, the other uh, few points were, which I wanted to make was uh, the desire of Africans to leapfrog into the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, so that's where the digital, uh, bridging the digital divide sort of comes in. Uh, there's also uh, both the entities, India and Africa, are emerging and rising players. So uh, that will also sort of uh, help uh, construct these next steps. Uh, this is, if it develops very well as it's on track to do, uh, going to be the defining partnership actually uh, with an enhancing cooperation in tourism, medicine, governance, SNT, science and technology, space, IT. I mentioned these areas, education, mining. Uh, we have common interests on international issues, UN reforms, counterterrorism, uh, peacekeeping, cybersecurity, energy security. So we do have uh, common interests to sort of build on this. Uh, the last two parts of my thing are same on building on this. Uh, what is the motivation for this? Uh, on the economic uh, aspect I wanted to bring out at the end, uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, it is the largest in the world after the WTO, as many of you are aware, but I don't know how many of you remember. Uh, this week, uh, we celebrate one year of this anniversary. And uh, with five of the 10 fastest growing economies of the world based in Africa, I think uh, some, I th I'm not sure how much the Indian corporate sector has actually focused uh, on the significance of this African continental free trade agreement. So that needs to be sort of uh, talked about more in Indian corporate circles. And uh, the last of the economic change which actually happened earlier this week was uh, France cutting off its links with the CFA. Uh, this was 75 years back when the CFA was launched. And the uh, entire currency is now being done away with the French silver, and it will be called the ECO. Uh, of course, uh, those in the field, uh, Exim Bank will be maybe aware of it, but I'm not sure how many others have noticed it because it will have huge impact on trade and <laughs> in that part of the world, West Africa, where I've served in Dakar, as I was saying. And uh, since I started on a personal note, I think I'll end on a personal note also. I was charged with affair at that time uh, in the early 90s when the CFA franc was devalued. Uh, by 100 uh, percent. I luckily managed to save the government uh, uh, a lot of money 
Uh, but that's another story for another day. I'll exceed Manisha's time limit if I go on. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to listening to all. Uh, thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Mr. Chabla, for that uh, magisterial big picture view of India's relations with Africa. You brought out uh, uh, new avenues of India-Africa partnership, focusing on the challenges, and also map the way ahead. In the interest of conserving time, and of course, we will hear more from Mr. Chabra as he takes over. Uh, you know, the uh, kind of he's going to be in charge of uh, uh, steering India's Africa diplomacy rights uh, very shortly. Uh, so, thank you very much for that uh, uh, big picture speech. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we uh, move on to the uh, to the conference that is a panel discussion. Uh, before we begin, uh, essentially, I want to uh, outline some ground rules uh, for all speakers as well as participants. Uh, as we have a galaxy of uh, very eminent speakers, it's a star-studded panel. I'm structuring the panel discussion in form of Q and A. Each speaker will address a couple of questions posed by me, and I will request all speakers to confine their remarks to the questions posed and respond in maximum five to seven minutes. Uh, I'm sure we all have much to speak. I would really appreciate if, at least for some time, you would restrain your gift for eloquence and oratory and be precise. To make the webinar more interactive, I also invite questions from uh, question participants will like to pose to an individual speaker. I will pose them to the speaker on your behalf in the in the course of the presentation itself. We will of course come to a full fledged Q and A session. Uh, Mr. Chabra has also agreed to take a few questions after all speakers have said their part. Uh, so let me move on to the next speaker. Uh, I'm not sure whether Ambassador of Eritrea is with us today. Uh, I don't see him here. He was telling me he's not too well, and he would very much like to be here, but I don't see him here. But he has sent me a short message. Uh, Ambassador of Eritrea, as you all know in this audience, probably many of you, he's Dean of Heads of African Mission in India. So in some ways, he speak for the entire diplomatic community, resident diplomatic community, community <coughs> African, hosted in Delhi. He serves uh, on behalf of uh, the Dean of Heads of African Mission. Uh, he says, it's a great pleasure for me to deliver this message that happens to coincide with the 2020 Africa Day celebrations. Uh, suffice me to note that Africa Day celebrations represent <coughs> Avenue to recall and celebrate some landmark achievements of the African Union on various issues, including among others, promotion of peace, security and stability, infrastructure development, continental integration, women and youth empowerment, poverty alleviation, and eradication of diseases. The theme of this year's celebration is silencing the guns, creating conducive conditions for Africa's development. To that end, silencing the guns in Africa was reaffirmed as a flagship project of Africa's agenda, 2063, requiring all Africans to work together towards ending all wars, civil conflict, gender-based violence, violent conflicts, and preventing genocide. Sadly, however, instead of taking stock of achievements and challenges, we've been confronted by a different kind of war, the global coronavirus disease or COVID-19, a health pandemic that has been raging the world, ravaging the world since it was first identified in January 2020. Uh, he speaks about, goes on to speak about in his message about the third India-Africa summit and the really important part and his appreciation for India providing much needed medicine to many African nations in this hour of need. Uh, he has a, an important request and that uh, uh, with Mr. Chabra uh, around, uh, he may like to take a note of this. He says that uh, 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 he says that uh, COVID-19 uh, has and is adversely affecting the finances of all African countries. I therefore suggest 
that India relaxes servicing schedules so the lines of credit and buyer facilities extended to African countries in view of the situation. The, this, in my view, is a least support India can extend to African countries in the spirit of India-Africa partnership during the period of this pandemic, even as we work towards the fourth India-Africa Forum Summit. He goes on, he is all quite optimistic about African resurgence, even in this hour of distress for the continent. Uh, he says the African continental free trade area uh, will create a single largest market for goods and services and movement of uh, uh, persons in order to deepen the economic integration of the African continent. I urge India, for that matter, Indian industrialists and other business establishments to consider relocating some of their activities and production lines to Africa in order to enjoy the enormous opportunities that will emerge including duty-free and quota-free access and when the, uh, the free trade area fully takes off. So it's a variant of, he's asking Indian companies to basically make in Africa uh, uh, a, a, a really inspiring and a very empowering initiative if that can be done. Uh, and he says that uh, those to all health workers and health service providers for the wonderful jobs they are doing to fight this rather mysterious disease. As we say in Africa, this too shall pass. So this was the message of uh, the Dean of African Diplomatic Code. Uh, I hope uh, uh, Mr. Chabra has taken note of the point about India relaxing lines of credit. Now we move on to the our next speaker. Uh, I'm so very happy uh, to welcome uh, Ambassador Anil Suplal, Professor Anil Suplal. Uh, he's joining us from uh, Johannesburg. He's the Deputy Director General uh, responsible for Asia and Middle East, Department of International Relations and Cooperation, Republic of South Africa. In addition to his duties as Deputy Director General, he's also South Africa's BRICS Sherpa, G20 Sherpa, and IFSA Sherpa, and the IORA representative. He's got a uh, quite a, uh, you know, a large uh, portfolio of responsibilities. Uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, I mean, I don't want to go on uh, reading out long bios of all the speakers. They're very eminent people. I believe the bios have been circulated to all of you. It will be also circulated after the conference is over uh, for people who are not familiar with the full profile. Uh, uh, so basically, let me ask Ambassador Anil Sukla uh, uh, to talk about uh, you know, South Africa is the chair of the African Union. And the African Union is going to play a major role uh, in sharing Africa's post-COVID uh, recovery and the ongoing efforts to combat the uh, pandemic. You may like to focus uh, briefly on what South Africa as the chair of the AU is doing in this context. And number two, uh, uh, you should also look at uh, uh, you know, given his portfolio as uh, uh, his, uh, you know, role as uh, South Africa's BRICS shared by NIPSA, the role of multilateral or plurilateral in, uh, in combating the pandemic. Over to you, Professor Sukla. Thank you, uh, Manish. Let me firstly congratulate uh, you and India and the World a Magazine for hosting this very important event, uh, coinciding with Africa Day. Happy Africa Day to all of our colleagues and Eid Mubarak to our Muslim sisters and brothers. Uh, let me start before I come to, to your question to also welcome and congratulate uh, Ambassador Chabra into his new position. I look forward to working closely with you, having worked closely with Ambassador Tirumurthy uh, recently. Uh, I think the pandemic is a pause moment for the entire global community. It's also a great leveler. It doesn't matter whether you are a large or a small country, rich or poor, or from which part of the world you have come from. We are all equally affected. And I think this year is an important year for the global community as we mark the 75th anniversary of the founding of the UN. But for Africa, it is equally a seminal year as 
it is the year in which the African Continental Free Trade Agreement was going to be operationalized. First July was actually the date for to operationalize the, the agreement. Uh, South Africa is in the fortunate position of having the privilege and honor to chair the African Union for the second time. We chaired it when we transitioned from the OAU to the AU in 2002 in Durban. And once again, we assumed the chairship in February this year. And President Ramaphosa at the summit uh, in Addis in, on the 9th of February this year, outlined the key priorities that South Africa will focus on. And the focus has been on continuity. Uh, he spoke about focusing on the issue of economic integration of the continent, the political integration of the continent, fully operationalizing the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, the advancement uh, of women, especially women's economic empowerment and entrepreneurship, promoting the values of good governance and democracy, working closely with the African Union and the UN, and of course, promoting peace and security on the continent by emphasizing the AU's focus on silencing the guns. These were the key priorities outlined by President Ramaphosa. South Africa was due to host an extraordinary summit at the end of May, uh, two summits back to back, one focusing on silencing of the guns and the other on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Of course, because of the challenge of COVID-19, uh, these have been postponed, but they are still on track. I think Ambassador Chabra has outlined in great detail the deep cooperation between India and Africa on various levels. I, I think it's important to keep that at the back of the mind. But it's also important to understand that over the past three or so decades, Africa has entered into a number of key partnerships, the India-Africa partnership being one of those. And we have been privileged to have witnessed three of those summits. I was a participant in the December 2015 summit in Delhi, and we are busy preparing for the fourth summit. But perhaps what we need to ask ourselves in this period of reflection forced upon us by the tsunami of the pandemic is how can we do things slightly differently? And how can Africa and India maximize this partnership going forward post COVID? There are a number of fault lines that have been exposed on the international front, be it political, economic, and other areas that has shown us our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities. Most for the African continent, I think it has been fortuitous that we have put forward this template of the Continental Free Trade Agreement, and it has been most timeless. It's an opportunity for us in this moment of difficulty. As Ambassador Chabra has pointed out, the predictions in terms of contraction of the global economy and the African economy is going to be quite severe. And as was pointed out at the G20 summit, uh, Africa is going to need a lot of assistance. We'd also like to thank uh, India for the assistance they have been providing to the African continent, South Africa included, in the telecom between uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Ramaphosa in his capacity as AU chair. They spoke ex extensively about this cooperation and what more can be done in this field. I think as Prime Minister Modi outlined the key uh, guiding principles in the India-Africa partnership at the 2015 summit, and he echoed this further during his state visit to Uganda when he addressed the Ugandan parliament. What is needed now is for us to unpack each of these guiding principles and synergize it in terms of Agenda 2063. There's a great deal of complementarity here. Both India and Africa accounts for almost one third of global population. But what is our combined share of global trade? Under 10%, Africa's share is between two to 3%. In this day and age, this is a serious, serious slight 
in terms of how global trade is conducted. And we need to really look this uh, again and what can be done differently to ensure that Africa and India become part of the mainstream. One of the fault lines that has been uh, shown quite severely during this COVID-19 uh, impact is the disruption of global supply chains. And Africa is not very much part of the global supply chain and the global value chains. We are much on the margins. How can we become part of the mainstream? And Ambassador Chabra has outlined several things that are being done in this partnership. I think this partnership can be characterized into four key areas. How Africa and India can work on the peace and security front in collaboration, much is being done already on the economic and the social front and on the people to people front. There are a number of key areas. When you were reading out the statement of the Dean and the Dean was appealing to make in Africa, I think it's not just about make in Africa or make in India. It is about how we can jointly produce together for the mutual benefit of both India and Africa. And I think there are tremendous opportunities and we have to look at the niche areas where we can add value to this relationship. And Ambassador Chabra has outlined several areas, especially the pharmaceutical, the medicine field, the ICT area in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, the agro sector, the capacity and skills development, remembering that both Africa and India have the most youthful population. This is a major, major advantage for us if it is harnessed properly. And I think, yeah, India can partner with Africa in terms of empowering our youth, in terms of skills and capacity building, and of course, in terms of manufacturing. Where we don't centralize manufacturing to one or two centers of the world, and in times of disruption like this, we become casualties. We need to relook the model of the linear model of, of uh, value chain supply, of producing, using, and discarding. We need to have a more secular model in terms of, of production. And I think this will also assist in terms of the impact on the environment and how we can jointly collaborate in addressing the challenges of climate change. And I think, yeah, India and Africa can work closely together. So I think it's a moment for us to relook these partnerships. The template is there in terms of what we've agreed on, but how can we do things slightly differently so that as we speak of empowering Africa and Africa becoming more independent and becoming a center for manufacturing and, and part of the global value chain supply chain, what role can India play in partnering with us for the joint benefit? The other important uh, partnership that we need to focus on between India and Africa, as was pointed out over the past two or three decades since the launch of the African Union, democracy has taken root, good governance has taken root, Africa has shown leadership in the continent itself. And these values are central, the fundamental values of human rights, the African Court uh, on people and human rights being an example. How can we build on this on the global stage? The whole United Nations system is paralyzed at the present time. We saw the attempts at the United Nations Security Council now to put a halt to global conflicts during the time of the pandemic. This didn't fly. It just shows how paralyzed the UN system is. As we celebrate 75 years, what is it we are celebrating? because you still have an Africa that is marginalized from the Security Council. The reform process is 20 years down the line, and where are we? So within the context of BRICS and IPSA, I think Africa and India must push the reform agenda of the multilateral institutions, especially the Security Council. And I think, yeah, we need to collaborate and see how we create a more inclusive global society that does not marginalize Africa and other parts of the world. I think I will leave it here at this point. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for those very valuable suggestions, very concrete recommendations uh, for next steps in India-Africa partnership. Thank you for your presentation. We'll come back to some questions from the audience. Now, we want to uh, Her Excellency Grace Akilo, Uganda's High Commissioner to India. Uh, Uganda is the High Commissioner to India for, you know, uh, I, I should mention on a personal note, uh, has been very proactive and, uh, you know, really uh, been very encouraging of this initiative, this webinar we are organizing. 
and uh, Adam, can you hear me? I can hear you very well, thank yeah, you. Yeah. And uh, she has a gift for writing. Uh, she is apparently a great admirer of what India is, or at least, uh, you know, how India is handling the pandemic and the lessons it holds for the Uganda and the African continent. Uh, Excellency, I would like you to focus in your remarks for five to six minutes maximum uh, on this particular aspect that what is the relevance or how do you look at the Indian experience uh, or so far the way India has handled the pandemic and what lessons or what is, what is the value of that experience for uh, for Africa. Also, I've seen that, you know, all the, you know, what we have done as acts of solidarity, for example, the lamp lighting, the air lighting, and all that, uh, Uganda had created quite a buzz and, uh, uh, and in other parts of Africa. How do you look at this cultural affinity and going forward in terms of setting the agenda for India, Africa, the next India, Africa summit, can you talk about some iconic projects that two countries can partner, two, two regions can partner with? Over to you, Your Excellency. Well, thank you very much. First, I would like to thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, Ambassador, uh, our, the High Commission of India to Nairobi for chairing this and bringing out the issues that we are all uh, grappling with very, very clearly. Uh, so I want to thank you, Excellency, Mr. Chabra. I would like to salute all of you, Excellencies, um, Ambassadors, High Commissioners, and Senior Officials from whichever part of the world you are listening to this webinar. Um, and thank you for participating in it. Uh, I think I will echo my, my Dean's um, quote of the Africa Day theme as silencing the guns and say that while the continent had actually worked very closely towards achieving this, and I think that there have been some notable achievements on the continent with a few hotspots here and there, but basically it was moving towards it and it would have mopped up everything. Well, then coronavirus started its own guns on the continent, but that perhaps that's why we are all here. So I just want to concentrate on um, the two questions that uh, have been asked by our convener. And I uh, want to start by saying that uh, Uganda-India relationship during this uh, is divided into three sections. One prior to COVID, during COVID, and after COVID. Very briefly, I'll say that before uh, COVID, we had high-level consultations in many areas, which culminated in ministerial meetings. Uh, we were working on a mechanism to establish uh, collaboration between our drug agencies especially in Uganda, in my country, Uganda, they wanted to collaborate with the, with the counterpart agency, of course, bigger, with the wider responsibilities, the drug agency of India. Then um, before COVID, we had the private sector engagements in uh, Uganda, between Uganda and India, where you got, uh, the private sector in India has gone to Uganda and established hospitals and established diagnostic centers and is working on pharmaceuticals and, and the pharmaceutical industries. One of the most notable of these uh, was the donation by the government of India of uh, uh, a cancer, a cancer machine in our Uganda Cancer Institute, which was very well welcomed. This was done during the visit of the Prime Minister Modi. Uh, Prime Minister Modi. And then we had an, an, an NGO, a pharmaceutical company, donating a mobile van, a mobile cancer van throughout the country. That was prior to COVID. Then COVID hits us, and uh, my president requests permission to talk to the Prime Minister of India because of the warm relations that exist between us. Uh, this call was made between the two principals, and uh, the object of that call was solidarity, but more than the solidarity, the president actually made a request for some drugs to be sent to Uganda, which India obliged and sent us some drugs, for which we thank the country very, very much. Uh, but I think the discussion had gone further than that, the, the physical acquisition of the drugs. The Uganda were thinking of being able to manufacture some of this uh, COVID, especially the hydrochloroquine uh, by itself. And so there's already an Indian company, CIPLA, well established in Uganda. And so these resources were availed by the government of India to CIPLA to be able to manufacture hydrochloroquine on the ground. We thank you very much for this. Now, post-COVID in the health sector, I think that the high-level consultations on, on health issues should continue. Uh, 
in, indeed, I, I, I would say that uh, the health minister should feature highly in one of the uh, forum summit uh, events because there was uh, a defense ministers, then there was uh, agriculture ministers, and I don't recall there being a meeting put in this summit within the context of the summit for health ministers. And I think this is a very important area. Another very important area for for Uganda in particular, and, and I feel very strongly about this, is that we we wanted to establish a link between our drugs authority and the Indian drugs authority. This is because we have a very very big problem of fake drugs entering our market. And some of our suppliers, you know, will tell you this is for treating, especially malaria, uh, this is for treating this and the other. And the efficacy of the drugs, some of them were found to be zero. And we know that India produces better drugs and has the, the means to monitor the drug production, the, the people who produce these drugs and so on. And Uganda wanted to collaborate very much and still wants to collaborate with the Indian Drugs Authority. Then another area of uh, research now, another area of collaboration post-COVID would be a very close working relationship with our virus uh, institute in Entebbe. We, I think that Uganda has a lot to offer on the research that they have done on virology, because for example, we dealt with Ebola, but also now we are seeing that India is, uh, is uh, a much more advanced, uh, has got much more advanced research capacity than us and technologies. So we want to form very close collaboration with us then we should also facilitate the private sector to, to set pharmaceuticals in, 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 in Africa, if you like, but in, in the particular case of Uganda, in Uganda, there is no reason why we should not establish joint research between uh, the formal conventional med medicines research, as well as the Ayurveda, with some of the facilities and some of the resources that we have in Uganda. As you know, Africa has got uh, roots, its, root, its tradition of root medicine, herbal medicines, which goes centuries, and some of them are more effective than the others. And indeed, they are resources of some of the material for manufacturing drugs. So why don't we take this opportunity now to go into Africa, Uganda-India relation, I mean, uh, Africa-India relationship, go into Africa and like my dean said, locate there and do some research on uh, African herbs and roots medicines. Now, I will talk about something else, which is, um, which would be iconic, I guess, but not so iconic in the sense that agriculture you know, in Africa, we, we have, Africa has about 25% of the, of, of, of the planet's uh, land, land mass. And if our agriculture were unleashed and had the sort of revolution that has happened in other parts of the world, Africa, the, the, the planet would not need to worry about food at all because Africa would supply the food. This also would be the, the starting point for a big industrialization pro program throughout Africa. And some of the African countries which have actually uh, uh, had the economies grow, have grown from this industrialization of the agricultural sector because the agricultural sector provides jobs for the youth and the youth problem will be solved. Agricultural sector, when it's properly utilized, industrialized manufacturing, agro-processing will produce for you credible quantities of goods in large quantities, which will supply not only the domestic markets in, in the various countries in Africa, which will not, will not only supply indeed Africa itself, it will be a food supply for the world, all kinds of uh, food related. However, the green, tech, the green revolution that I'm looking for, uh, we are worried a little bit about it because we, we have learned a lot about how the revol uh, the, that revolution has been hijacked by some high companies, high chemical industries, which produce chemicals which kill the soils. So we have had the advantage of looking at the green revolutions in other countries, indeed in India, how you attained it with your massive irrigation, massive fertilizer use, and so on, and farmer education and adaptation. You, you were successful in that. So we would like to learn, and if we were to move into that area, India would make a big impact. Because the most important thing in a person's life, all of our lives, is food. And I think one of the items that we all were very worried about during the COVID experience was where to get the next food from. Unfortunately for India, it was in bountiful supply, but it could have been. Some people didn't have enough in some other areas. And so a, a, a revolution, Africa's green revolution should be what we should uh, focus on. Now, with this revolution comes the issue which my dean again talked about, domesticating some of your industries in Africa. Africa's agriculture is embedded with so many problems, but yet it is an agriculture which is dependent on all technologies. 
India has got a large array of uh, agro, agro technologies which, it should, which could be manufactured on the continent and some of them could be reproduced for the particular circumstances, the soils and the land area and so on of the regions in Africa. So why don't we domesticate this in, in, on the continent? Last, let me touch very, very briefly on um, the funding mechanism. Now, uh, our, our, our chairman talked about lines of credit, for which I thank him. But I think that we have to look at uh, uh, these lines of credit or the money that India is putting out to Africa uh, with, with a lot of creativity. Because some countries may not be able, all of us now are worried about uh, self-reliance, self-reliance. And the issue about self-reliance, one of the issues around self-reliance is this uh, fear of, uh, you know, being financially strapped, you know, uh, debts, foreign debts. So, and many of us are looking at it now. Now, um, on the other hand, we have a private sector, which India is famous for, which could take advantage of this money which India has for Africa and use it creatively to achieve the same goals in Africa. So while we are talking about lines of credit, I think one of the areas we'll need to look at in, in this post-COVID uh, um, analysis of our relation is how we can actually get the money that India has for Africa developed uh, and not make a loss out of it. Because I understand the principle is that if you give it, give out the loan, you get some, some returns from that loan. I want to stop there and I want to thank you again very much for giving me this time and I hope I haven't taken too much of it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Excellency, for that very uh, pointed presentation, especially your suggestions on the way ahead in the agriculture and manufacturing sectors. Uh, I'm going to deviate slightly from the program that was circulated. I want to shuffle African and Indian panelists. Uh, may I now invite uh, Exim Bank Managing Director uh, David Raskina to speak about uh, uh, India's uh, development. Uh, in Africa. Uh, Mr. Raskina, are you there? Yes, very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, you have five to seven minutes uh, and uh, please focus uh, my two questions to you is that obviously because uh, of the lockdown and, you know, complete devastation of sorts that have been, you know, uh, unleashed by the pandemic, how do we carry, uh, how do we implement these lines of projects and we have the whole lot, you know, Africa is the second largest recipient of uh, Indian lines of credit. How do we see this going forward? Uh, do we have a roadmap of the sort? So essentially, you know, how do we carry in these very difficult and trying times? And uh, going ahead, you know, the agenda, I mean, we are talking about pandemic as though, you know, it only erupted three months ago, but it all, it almost looks like pre pandemics and post pandemic as in before pandemic, like before crisis or something, we have forgotten what the world was like. Uh, so going, moving beyond the pandemic, how do you see our development partnership going forward? Thank you. What do you know? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chand. Uh, I put off my video because of connection issues. That's why you couldn't see me. Uh, let me address the two questions you mentioned. One is, uh, how is the lockdown affecting the implementation of the lines of credit and where do we go from here? Now, of course, in a lockdown, just about every project is going to come to a halt. Any project, by definition, relies on long supply chains. It relies on logistics, inflow of materials, outflow, the supply of human labor, and workers who will have to necessarily be concentrated. The moment you have a lockdown or even the semblance of a lockdown, a project, by definition, cannot function. And it would be positively dangerous for it to function because you're going to have a lot of people working in close concert. So for the moment, definitely in many parts of the projects where the lines of credit are concerned, there is a temporary halt. Now, uh, work which has already been done has been built, has been paid. We are still making disbursements. Even today, funds are being released. But this is all reflecting work which has already been done earlier and has been built along. As the time moves forward, that is definitely going to slow down. In the short run, it's not going to have a big impact. It depends how long the lockdown lasts, how serious the lockdown is. Can we get back on course in a couple of months? Then we should not have a major problem. However, if the lockdown lasts longer than that, then yes, economics of a project are going to be impacted. And that is something which we will have to look at going forward. 
more than the economics of an individual project, and I think the point came up both with Mr. Chabra was speaking and Her Excellency uh, Madam Grace was speaking also, this is going to have an impact on the fiscal situation in Africa. Most of the African economies are dependent on two major sources of revenue. One is commodities and the second is tourism. Both, unfortunately, are going to be hit. Commodity prices have taken a blow not just oil or coal, but metals, ores. In parallel with the decline in economic activity across the world, all commodity prices have taken a blow. So this is very good news for commodity importing countries. It's not at all good news for commodity exporting companies. More to the point, tourism is a huge revenue earner in many African countries. And naturally, with the COVID, tourism is simply not going to happen. So you're going to face a crunch on fiscal revenues exactly at a time when expenditure, especially on the health sector, is going to go up. So this means there is going to be a significant fiscal crunch, both from the inflow side as well as the outflow side. And this brings me to the second part of your question, which you wanted me to speak on the role of financial institutions. Where do FIs come into the picture on this? Now, here is where I would separate the role of uh, financial institutions into what I would call the commercial financial institutions and the development financial institutions. The development financial institutions, of course, you have the multilaterals like the World Bank, the African Development Bank, and I would include within that the Exim Banks like the Exim Bank of India, which has the privilege of implementing the Government of India's lines of credit uh, program. We have the honor of being the operating agency and have been doing so since 2003, uh, using our financing network and our ability to uh, raise funds and manage projects. Such funding tends to be very long duration, for example, the Indian lines of credit range from anything from 15 to 25 years, including a moratorium period. So here the burden on a government tends to be much smaller as compared to what I would call the commercial financiers, which are predominantly the bond markets or the syndicated loan markets. Now, the bond markets or syndicated loan markets have a link to the tenor of the loan. So as a result, in order to keep pricing under control, countries tend to go in for relatively shorter term financing, three years, five years, etc. And this has a huge impact on debt servicing. Now, if we are going to address this issue, and definitely it's a very valid point, then all of us have to work together. You cannot have a situation where one set of financiers is moving in one direction and another set of financiers is moving in another direction. And the elephant in the room here, of course, is the particularly large lenders. The large lenders to individual African countries have in, are in a position where the debt burden is extremely compelling and needs to be addressed on priority basis. So the need of the R here is for all the G20 nations perhaps to sit together so that we do not have the classic economics problem of the freeloader. Mm -hmm. The freeloader problem in economics is well known. You cannot have one country or a set of countries benefiting from the views of the other parties. And that is something which we need to look at going forward. Nor is this the time, of course, to uh, uh, change the uh, system. Assistance to African countries would be uh, is ongoing. Even mm -hmm. today, I am getting proposals uh, which have been cleared by the Honorable External Affairs Minister and mm -hmm. the Honorable Finance Minister for lines of credit. Exim Bank is even today clearing new lines of credit proposals, new projects. So there's been no change. Uh, because of the lockdown, we probably are working from home, as you can see from the rather interesting background behind me. But other than that, our functioning has not been impaired at all. Going forward, however, there are some areas definitely that we can look at. Certainly, health is an area which all of us, perhaps all around the world, need to look at in greater detail. We have spent our time on building physical infrastructure, on building manufacturing capability, and absolutely nothing wrong with that. But we do, do need to look at education and health, the soft infrastructure, which perhaps gets less of the glamour, but in the long run is much more useful for a country. And the COVID pandemic has definitely brought out to all of us, and I'm not talking only of Africa, I'm talking of the entire world, the lacunae in our expenditure on health. Perhaps we can make a start with that in Africa. There are several of the lines of credit which are addressing the health sector in countries like Zambia, in countries like Cote d'Ivoire. And I'm sure we would like to look broadly across it. And Mr. Chabra has already made the very valid point that the Indian lines of credit are at the volition of the countries. That is the choice of project, the choice of utilization of the lines is from that of the user government. And we do not try to impose uh, our views on that. Uh, was that bell for me, Mr. Chan? 
Yeah, I mean, you could take maybe another minute to round up. <laughs> okay, sure. And uh, sure. The final point I would like to make is we need to encourage investment more. The projects under the lines of credit are certainly ex excellent, but Mr. Chabra already made the point of Rivatex. Rivatex was the rehabilitation of a textile plant by Indian machinery, by Indian technology. But that plant today is manufacturing an item, as he rightly pointed out, of uh, masks which it was never intended to make in the first place. But that shows how versatile a manufacturing unit can be and how investment into productive capacity in Africa will be a win-win situation both for the country in Africa as well as for India as well. Let me stop at this point. I have a lot more to say, but I do yeah, understand I your time constraint. Uh, uh, so let me hand it back to you and take questions uh, later. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, thanks for a host of uh, excellent suggestions going forward. We are going to be publishing and putting together all this. Uh, so at that point, you could probably add each of the speakers, you know, so that it's available for circulation. Uh, we are just constrained by time, and I know. Uh, uh, so let's move on to the. Uh, thanks for your uh, presentation. Now let me move on to the next speaker, uh, uh, Her Excellency uh, Tisita Mulugeta, Ambassador of the Federal Democratic Republic. She's the uh, only uh, lady in this panel. Uh, and uh, I uh, welcome you, madam. Uh, let me read out very briefly, of course, apart from being the ambassador of uh, Ethiopia to India, uh, she's also accredited to Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Uh, she's a PhD, grad, a PhD from University of Norway. And uh, uh, she's somewhat of a scholar from what I can gather. Uh, Excellency, uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, briefly, uh, two questions I would like you to address. Uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, India, we have a, uh, a kind of a special relationship, you know, uh, especially when we talk about development partnership, Indian investment in the sugar industry and all that. Uh, people to people uh, relations are quite robust. Uh, at this point, you know, in Ethiopia, apart from the bilateral relations is also the headquarters of the African Union. From Addis, and this is a question, uh, what does it look like to you, uh, you know, this, uh, the pandemic situation, uh, a big picture view, what is happening in Ethiopia, uh, what are your expectations from India? And going forward, uh, I will weave in a question because we may not have sufficient time later. Uh, this question uh, is from, uh, uh, Ambassador Rajiv Bhatia, India's former High Commissioner uh, to South Africa. He asked that what is the mood in Africa now that we are four, five months into uh, Corona age, will it make the world less attentive to the needs of Africa in months to come? Over to you, Excellency. Warm greetings to Excellency Sir and uh, dignitaries. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer who created such an opportunity to help to discuss on such uh, important issues on Africa Day despite such challenging time. As it is said repeatedly, uh, the India-Africa relationship is nothing new. It dates back to centuries and uh, both were partners for long years. Both historically and uh, politically, India is one of the most important partners of Africa and uh, after Africa, uh, after India got uh, its independent, it raised voices for African liberation, taking their cases to all the available international fora. So uh, when we discuss about mapping the next step in uh, India-Africa partnership, we need to focus on some fundamental points, like uh, there is always a sense of solidarity between Africa and India from long period of time. And also there is a feeling of shared historical experiences among Africa and India. Because of uh, similar socioeconomic condition between Africa and India, common solutions can be found if they work together. And uh, in addition to that, there are some focus of interest to be considered from both Africa and India perspective. That is, uh, contemporarily, Africa is in the midst of change with a flow of big amount of uh, foreign direct investment. It is also a continent named as a new growth pole with competitive and visionary population, an ample amount of natural resource. And also, uh, if we see uh, uh, economic development in Africa, six of the top fastest economies in the world, including Ethiopia, are found in Africa. 
And on the other hand, India is in a great nation with a consistent GDP growth, whereby its fast economic expansion can be an example of emerging Africa. And India has, has been a long partner for development in Africa. So uh, though this out, uh, the coronavirus outbreak uh, uh, put uh, the planned activities of uh, the fourth Africa-India summit suspended for some time, it is my uh, personal belief that the cooperation will continue in a stronger manner than before. Because there is a common understanding that solidarity and international cooperation are more than ever necessary to address this pandemic. As different uh, sources uh, shows, uh, so far African countries are taking different measures, both individually and collectively, to mitigate uh, uh, the virus. For instance, as a country, Ethiopia established high-level national COVID-19 preparation and response task force. A wide range of economic packages are designed to protect the most vulnerable section of the society, as well as sectors that have been adversely affected by the pandemic. And Ethiopia has also played a decisive role on behalf of Africa by requesting the G20 countries to grant debt relief and provision of COVID-19 emergency financing package to help even to cope with the health and economic emergency across the continent. Ethiopia has also dispatched COVID-19 packages uh, that has been uh, uh, provided by the uh, uh, foundation for 54 African countries. And also as a collective measures, we have heard that uh, several African leaders have, uh, has, have, have had a telephone conversation with Prime Minister uh, of uh, India and Prime Minister of India uh, conveyed his message that India will provide full support for the joint African effort against the virus. Even uh, with the phone call between Prime Minister of uh, India and Prime Minister of Ethiopia, uh, India also uh, uh, ensures that India will continue to support Ethiopia for ensuring supply of essential medicines and working on the economic impact of uh, the pandemic. So this conversation and message at a leader's level shows the strong solidarity between Africa and India leadership to combat the spread of the virus. And beyond this cooperation at, uh, at, at a leader's level, I believe there are several platforms of cooperation between Africa and India. That includes uh, health sectors, IT, energy, science, education, agriculture, and several kinds of trade partnership. For instance, from the perspective of uh, health sector, we know that India's health sector is one of the most relevant and influential responders of the crisis. And India is renowned as the world's largest generic pharmaceutical producer. And it is a significant supplier of PPE and other needed medicine. So in addition to providing essential medicine, India can collaborate by providing technical support and training to African health workers and professionals in related to COVID, either in virtual or in another way. India also must consider providing scholarship and internship to medical students from African countries to enable local expertise. So far, many African countries have sent their scholar for uh, university education in India. Ethiopia has like more than 1,000 uh, students who have been taking care, who have been following their education in India, but none of them are in the medical uh, faculty. So uh, creating such uh, opportunity would strengthen the relationship between Africa and India, even to combat uh, the, the existing outbreak. Moreover, Indian investors who are interested in medical related investment, including pharmaceutical or hospital industry, can take this as an opportunity for mutual advantage. For instance, Ethiopian government provides several benefits of, uh, for such kind of investors. And uh, my government is welcoming those who are interested in health related sectors and work in public-private partnership manner. In addition to that, government of Ethiopia is providing tax-free advantage for importers who are interested to supply PPE. And I believe this is also a good opportunity for producers and exporters of uh, COVID-related medicines and uh, personal protection equipment in India. In addition to that, uh, we, can, uh, the, uh, we, we can create a platform in terms of enhancing Africa-India trade partnership Currently, India is the fourth largest trading partner of Africa. Uh, however, uh, the trade balance between many African countries and India is against Africa, which is expected to be worsening during COVID-19. 
However, with more transparency and collaboration, Africa and India can enhance the trade partnership. The other platform could be uh, food production and processing, especially in the agriculture sector, as COVID gives many countries an opportunity to check how far they can be self-reliant in many aspects, Africans can also take this as an opportunity to revisit their food production capacity and diversification. Currently, many countries, including Ethiopia, are working towards being self-reliant in food production. And this would be a very good opportunity for many investors who has interest in agriculture, especially in crop production and food processing area. In relation to food production, I want also to emphasize that the current desert locust outbreak uh, is, uh, is expected to create severe impact in crop production in East Africa, including Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, and the Middle East, and also in India. But I believe that India is also, even if India is uh, also vulnerable in this aspect, it is uh, in a more uh, uh, better technical capacity to deal on the manner and uh, uh, to collaborate and to partnership with many African uh, countries. The other issue uh, is finance. Finance is also an uh, essential element for combating the virus and undertaking uh, development work. So uh, Africa and India need to closely work to make possible and enhance it effective and even speedy implementation of agreements on the line of credit that was made available by the government of India. Exim Bank of India should see different ways of financing initiatives and easing date repaying time to assist African countries. In this regard, as Exim Bank of India is one of Ethiopian economic partners, Ethiopian government had formally requested the Exim Bank of uh, India to suspend and rescheduled and repaid its date over long, long years. And my government is expecting a positive response to this uh, uh, kind request. And strengthening cooperation in safeguarding international peace and security, which is indispensable for real change and transformation in post-COVID uh, uh, is also one of uh, the issues that should be taken into consideration as a form of collaboration. And among all this, uh, further building strong people-to-people -people relation between people of Africa, people of Ethiopia and India, so as to for, uh, foster shared values and experiences sharing in the area of art, music, film, production can be, can be another form of uh, platform for uh, collaboration. Uh, last but not least, I want to stress on India's role in multilateralism on the international stage as an active leader amid the COVID-19 pandemic. India has been playing a major role as a humanitarian leader in this pandemic. It has been shipping tons of medical supply to nations in need. India proactively taking coordinating actions across bilateral, regional, and multilateral fronts by reaching out to a number of leaders to coordinate cooperation against the pandemic. India has been calling strengthening of the WHO powers and urged G20 leaders to support a new human-centric view of globalization. And Prime Minister uh, Modi also addressed in the virtual non-aligned movement uh, summit uh, that countries to discuss global management of COVID-19 and called for solidarity, okay? So this clearly shows how the Indian government gave special consideration to approach the pandemic and to understand the aggressive impact the virus will create in world social economic situation. In such a way, India could be a voice for Africa to urge international organization and most developed nations to quickly deliver the appropriate international financial assistance, date relief to cope with the health and economic emergency, as well as to combat and mitigate the negative impact of COVID-19 across the continent. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you, Excellency, for that uh, very uh, focused presentation on the way ahead. Uh, let me now invite uh, uh, Excellency Muhammad Maliki, Ambassador of Morocco to India.
He is also simultaneously accredited to Bhutan, Maldives, Sri Lanka. Uh, Excellency, are you around? Excellency Mohammad Maliki, are you around? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, I am. Ah, okay. All right. Welcome to you, sir. Uh, Thank you. So, you know, in the interest of time management, you know, I now looking back, I should have made panels, you know, probably this could have gone for an entire day with such a splendid cast of uh, experts and diplomats. But let me just uh, turn to you. And uh, 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 Excellency, my question to you is what one reads, uh, there is uh, North Africa region is among the most severely affected. Uh, and Morocco, uh, I mean, how are you facing, uh, why, why is the region, the, especially the North Africa region, the Arab Africa region, uh, more uh, affected by the pandemic? How is Morocco handling it? And looking ahead, you know, in terms of the India-Africa agenda, I want you to focus on just one issue, which is uh, one item, pair of cooperation, where Morocco has undoubted strengths, you know, renewable energy, for example, or you may have uh, other areas to speak of. My request to you would be, please be precise so that we can get questions from the audience. You have five to seven minutes, sir. After that, I will put this bell uh, and, uh, you know, would really appreciate if you can uh, finish your presentation with a lot of time. Over to you, sir. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon to everybody, and uh, let me uh, thank you, dear Chant, for this initiative in celebrating the Africa Day, which unfortunately we don't have the choice but to make it virtually. I still am quite happy that uh, you have the initiative of celebrating it. And uh, I wouldn't uh, move without wishing my uh, Muslim brothers and sisters a happy Eid. Uh, both in India and then worldwide, and to wish you all the best of health and then prosperity. I won't miss this opportunity also without congratulating uh, His Excellency Mr. Rahul Chabra for the, his appointment as the Secretary of Economic Relations. And I am looking, sir, to working with you very closely very soon, as we used to have a great friend like Terumoti. Let me start by the first question when you said that the North African countries have been a little bit more affected than the others. And it is quite natural because they are the closest countries to the epicenters like Spain, Italy, France, and all the others. So the, the huge diaspora which exists from Morocco and then from these countries in, the, in, the, in these countries have differently brought some of the cases, and then the, the, the pandemic has been also uh, watched developing steadily. But I believe that uh, great nations throughout history have always turned challenges into opportunities. And then for that uh, reason, probably because you asked me a direct question, I would like to tell that uh, when this COVID-19 broke, the Morocco has to, taken very steadily and then serious steps to, to counter it and to minimize the effects on the population by closing the, the borders, both maritime and then airline, where we were the first, almost among the first countries to impose masks. And then at the same time, when we started by this pandemic, Morocco used to produce a few thousands of masks. And then uh, because we knew that the challenge would be to get these uh, medical equipments as soon as possible, then the government, through a COVID uh, uh, fund, which created, and then which was able to get more than $3.5 uh, billion in a few, few days, from all parts, we were able to readapt some of the industries. And then now we are producing something like 10 million masks a day, which is a huge number. And then sufficiently supplying all the parts of Morocco and then also <clears throat> exporting it. Also in, come in terms of uh, other equipments, we were able to create our own, what you would say the, uh, the 
ventilator, which is 100% made in Morocco because of the, the bench. So the necessity sometimes is the mother field bench. That's why I want all of us from Africa and from India to see the pandemic not only to create or say probably negative things, but to look at it as, uh, oh, you can hear me? Hello? Yes, I, we can hear. Can, can you hear? Yes. We can hear you. Uh, because I didn't see anybody from the, from the, from the, from the screen. <laughs> we can hear you. <clears throat> uh, thank you. So I want uh, all of us to see the, this, this pandemic as a huge opportunity. A huge opportunity for us to rethink cooperation. And I believe it is quite important not to look always into Africa by bringing and thinking of bringing assistance and aid, but rather to think of co-development. And when I say co-development, means it's a win-win situation, it's win-win uh, partnerships where both parties can benefit. And uh, I think this, this pandemic has also shown to the world that vulnerability doesn't sometimes, uh, is not specific to some countries, like African countries or Asian countries. On the country, I think African countries have so far and that would are more resilient than other countries. But it showed that there is, should be a rethinking of the whole of the uh, cooperation worldwide. And I'm quite happy that my South African friend uh, has mentioned it. Yes, priorities are there, but we need to rethink them and then look at things differently. And then I think this pandemic has come into a timely moment in the sense that it is at the eve of the fourth India-Africa summit. So probably to me, this pandemic has shown at least four things to the whole world. And then of course, including to Africa. The first one, that scientific research is not a luxury to any country, but it is a survival. Second thing, that having a sound health system at home remains the most, and that's the most, and that's most necessity, which becomes less costly and represents an assurance for our future generations. We need to have trust into our systems by developing it. Third one, education is the backbone of all what we are doing now. And I think to achieve all these uh, uh, objectives, re education remains the, the only way to do it. Then I believe, it is a personal belief, that India and Africa need to involve all their means and resources to succeed in these hard times. And then here I would like to open uh, uh, brackets, and then when people say rightly that India is the pharmacy of the world, I can also confirm. And from this panel, I would like to express our sincere thanks for the Indian high authorities who have allowed and permitted export on a purchase basis, but permitted export to Morocco of some of the medications. So I want this pandemic to work for us and then to redefine priorities. All these priorities exist in the India. Africa Forum, but I want them to take the most part of it because it is the future. It is on equal basis. India and Africans have, don't, don't lack brains. In fact, most of the institutes worldwide are known to be uh, having brilliant minds from our countries. And then the last example, but not the least, is when Trump appointed the Moroccan national, Mr. Monsif, to chair or co-chair this committee to find a vaccine in the United States. So we don't need, we don't lack all these elements. We just need to create uh, additional uh, upper, uh, conditions for these workers and researchers to work. Last but not least, I think this, if India is able, because it has a very emotional and historical charges with Africa, and then it is a very serious asset for it, that if we manage to have this qualitative jump in our relations and the look into these priorities onto equality level. And then let me say that Morocco has always said through the highest authority, His Majesty, that you see Africans need to rely on themselves to develop, but they need also 
serious partners. And I think when we talked about seriousness, India stands and has a premium place, honestly, because of this historical and then emotional charges. And then because I see that uh, the, the time is exactly eight minutes for me, so I want to stick and then I'm quite happy to receive some questions. Thank you so much for inviting me. Wonderful, you. Excellency. Thanks so much uh, for that uh, very pithy and uh, very elegant presentation. And you stuck to the time limit. Really, really appreciate it. And now we move on to our next speaker, uh, Ambassador Virendra Gupta. Uh, Ambassador Gupta, are you around? Yes. Yeah, yes. I'm here. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, briefly, let me uh, just introduce him. He, uh, Ambassador Virendra Gupta served as India's High Commissioner to Tanzania, Trinidad and Tobago, South Africa, and several other Caribbean countries. He served as Deputy Director General of India's largest security studies think tank, IDSA, and Director General, ICCR. Uh, the full bio, as I told you, would be circulated and has already been circulated. So I move on now to uh, asking him uh, a couple of questions. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, Ambassador uh, Gupta, uh, enough has been said, and we have such a fantastic panel with great ideas coming in. Uh, you know, you could focus primarily on a kind of an action-oriented agenda uh, written about the India-Africa Forum Summit process. Then when we talk about the, the fourth summit, you know, ideally, if there was no, the pandemic had not happened, we would be probably having this summit towards the end of the year, but it will happen sooner or later uh, within the span of a year at the moment. Uh, how do you look at this evolving agenda? Uh, what are your what are your wish lists? What do you uh, where do you see the two regions going together? Thank you. Well, thank you, Manish. Uh, thank you, first of all, for uh, giving me an opportunity to share uh, a stage with very important, distinguished people, uh, and uh, providing me an opportunity to uh, see some of my very old friends, uh, Anil Suklal, uh, Rajan Harshe, Rahul, so many different people, mm -hmm. and I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I would touch upon just a few points because a lot has been said already. We are at the uh, closing, uh, we are at the end of this very important seminar. Happy Africa Day, first of all. I'd like to touch upon what Anil had briefly referred to, uh, the people-to-people -people connect. I think uh, when you look at India-Africa, you know, there are so many characteristics, so many defining uh, uh, things, uh, which I will not go into. But one of the most compelling things um, uh, things which distinguishes India-Africa relations, that people to people, strong people to people connect. Uh, now, it seems to me, unfortunately, that at the present time, our government uh, does not seem to be paying uh, adequate attention to strengthening these people to people uh, relationship. And it's been largely left to, you know, people themselves. We have a strong diaspora, we have had traditional and historic connect. But I think... Uh, you know, at the level of academics, for instance, uh, the relationship has uh, not remained as strong as it was. You know, the interest in African studies in India is dwindling, which is very unfortunate. And I think all of the activities need funds. So my suggestion, first of all, is for the government, while the government-to-government -government relationship is very robust, I think uh, we need to pay attention at the government level to strengthen people to people connect. And I think for that, uh, you know, you need to put money there. Uh, now, there, there are many which ways it can be done, but I just wanted to leave the short point. And while we are at the people to people connect, I think uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I'm quite embarrassed actually, quite frankly, uh, to see occasional um, uh, incidents of how we treat the Africans uh, in India. Uh, you know, I think that needs to stop uh, uh, completely. Uh, we need to be more conscious uh, at the level of our common people about uh, the strength of our relationship, about our historical connect. And I think there again, uh, the government agencies have to do a lot more in terms of creating greater awareness. Now, Manish, you asked me about you know, the way forward. How do we go forward on this uh, uh, India-Africa relationship? I know the fourth edition of the India-Africa Forum Summit uh, 
should have been taking place this year. I don't know whether it will take place this year, but soon enough. It doesn't matter whether it will take place this year or whether it takes place early next year. I think uh, uh, what I'd like to say is that uh, sir, there are some uh, the, the, the sectors, the areas that we need to focus on, particularly in the current times of difficulty. A lot of other speakers have reflected on it. I, I will not go into it. Uh, this mechanism, India, Africa, India, Pan Africa mechanism, uh, I think is going very well, but we need to be conscious about the limitations of that. Uh, there are, uh, you know, capacity constraints, for instance. Uh, and I think uh, it has been said uh, even earlier that uh, undue reliance, if we were to repose undue reliance uh, on the Pan-Africa platform alone for uh, delivery of our projects. Very often there is criticism that we are not able to implement. We, we make uh, very ambitious announcements, but we are not able to implement uh, those projects. And, and to me, it seems that the reason primarily is that we depend too much on uh, the Pan-African uh, platforms. Uh, now, if, you, if I were to look at uh, South Africa, uh, India has excellent relations with South Africa. Uh, at the political level, at the economic level, at the people's level, our BRICS membership. Uh, and whenever you look at uh, either the entire continent or individual countries, the question of China comes in. Uh, I think to my mind, uh, that is an irrelevant question because uh, it's a mug's game to begin to compare ourselves with uh, China in trying to see what we can do with Africa. There is a lot we can do with Africa. We have our unique strengths. Uh, but I think what we have to understand, South Africa as a large country, as a powerful country in Africa, uh, has unique role. It, it, has, it is the chair of the African Union. It has always played a very important role at the African continent, at the Pan-African level. But I think even more important than that, I would say, is South okay. Africa's role at the regional level, at the Southern Africa level. South Africa has a unique... Uh, role in Southern Africa, in SADC. And I think uh, we are conscious of that, but I think uh, we need to leverage that a little more than what we've been doing. Uh, and the same would apply to Nigeria. We have excellent relations with Nigeria, and Nigeria equally has an important role to play in West Africa. Uh, so what I'm trying to say, uh, uh, without taking too much time, is that uh, we need to... Uh, you know, go beyond the Pan-African, uh, uh, you know, platform uh, and begin to relook and look at how we can strengthen our uh, instrumentalities, our cooperation uh, with individual countries in Africa at bilateral level and even more important, uh, approach them at the regional level and at that regional level, I think we, we are not doing enough uh, in uh, connecting with Africa at different regional levels. Uh, and I think in Africa, these regional configurations are extremely important. And that is where our relationship, our special relationship with South Africa, our special relationship with Nigeria will begin to play a very important role. Thanks, Manish. Uh, not audible. Manish, you are not audible. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Ajay Gupta, for that very forward-looking uh, presentation with some very, uh, you know, concrete recommendations uh, charting the way ahead. Uh, we now move on to our next speaker, uh, Excellency Ambassador of Mali to, to India. I remember visiting Mali two, three years ago. Uh, I, I was traveling with Vice President of India. And I was amazed at the vibrancy of the place. Bamako, not many go, is one of probably Africa's largest city. And it buzzes with life. Mali, for those uh, of you who are uh, not too familiar, uh, also had uh, parliamentary elections uh, after the outbreak of pandemic. Am I right, Excellency? But parliamentary elections. Can you hear me? Excellency, can you hear me? Mute yourself. 
you have to unmute yourself. Excellency, I can't hear you. Ambassador of Mali. I can't hear. Excellency, you have to unmute yourself. Can you can you see a button there? Manish, can I come? Yeah, okay. Okay, we'll fix that. Yeah, all right. Uh, all right, uh, we will uh, uh, go back to Mali's ambassador in a while. Uh, may I now invite uh, uh, Professor Rajan Harsi, an eminent Africanist, uh, author, intellectual, thought leader, you know, he's written numerous books on Africa, Africa India relations. Rajan Harsi, Professor Harsi brings that academic perspective here to the discussion today. Uh, sir, you know, given your new book, which is about Africa, right? Uh, I, would like to, uh, uh, I would like you to focus primarily on uh, how do you look at the pandemic? You know, there is talk about pandemic bringing down the growth rate, economic growth rate. Uh, but given, Af given Africa's pivotal role in advancing the UN reform process, and the reform process of global governance institutions, do you think pandemic will diminish in the, uh, Africa's capacity? Or in a way, it will serve as a provocation uh, going forward to accelerate reform of global governance architecture? Uh, since we have very limited time, if you address this question, uh, it would come uh, a value uh, to all of us. Thank you very much, Panish. Let me wish all the participants happy Eid and happy 25th May Africa Day. Uh, I will briefly address myself because a lot has been already said. The audience has been building and I know attention span of everybody can be limited. So let me just come straight to the brass tacks. One is that this pandemic is likely to continue for six to eight months more very easily because there is no sign of vaccine everywhere. One very serious problem that India has been facing is because of this, it has disrupted India's economy, disrupted world economy, disrupted all the supply chains, reduced the demands, and it is really a major global crisis, a major crisis for India, and we have to come out of it. This is going to take quite a while before we come out, and still, in the past, India has always made uh, opportunities out of crisis which came. Like in 1991, India came out of 1991 crisis when foreign exchange reserves were so limited. Today, India has you know, robust foreign exchange reserves, but there are other problems in the economy. 2008 crisis also India faced, and I'm sure this particular crisis also India is going to face. And India and Africa both will kind of rebuild their partnership, they reunite and do many more things in the next decade to come. I think while Hearing the speakers, I thought that some of the points which uh, Ambassador Virendra Gupta made, I'll just try to put across or emphasize them more. One thing that I thought was that you know, India has always emphasized on developing local capacities and capacity building in Africa, and that is necessary during this time. That initially, perhaps you know, give them testing machines, you give them you know, ventilators, you give them all such equipments which allow Africans to come out of this crisis and India is also helping itself in this way. But subsequently, as the kind of capacity building also involves long-term plan towards education and India and Africa, they have to have long-term plan towards education as well as health. Both these sectors require a great deal of investments and somewhere steps have to be taken around this right away. As far as education is concerned, I think India can share its expertise and learn from Africa and give Africa something most certainly, especially digital divide, then scientific and technical knowledge. And this digital divide can be easily bridged because India surely is one of the important soft powers in the world today. And Africans can become uh, drivers on the international superhighway if India as a soft power is used, India's technical expertise is used, and they can access public health, they can access education. Um, 
Ministry of Education also started programs like e Partsala, where you know educational partnership, research and scientific uh, development related partnership. If that is developed, I think we will have clear idea of facts and how we can proceed further. There is also one more area which you know, both have to face apart from economy, and that is climate change. I think this is a serious issue, and India and Africa both have to work together to see that the you know, climate change challenges we are able to encounter. Already there is international solar alliance operating, 48 countries are members, 25 African countries are members of it. But most important part is evolving green technologies, evolving technologies and scientific research, which allows us to face climate problems and also persuading developed countries constantly to see that common differentiated responsibilities adhered to when climate change is faced and that they should share burden of the finances to see that look, India and African countries together can get something out of them and they need to give lots of funds. Uh, this What they give is very limited. They have to give funds and not impose reforms on developing world. Another problem that I thought I should say and that is you know, concerns broader area of security. I think not many people handled it, so I will quickly put across what I feel. There are traditional and non-traditional security areas, but security should be our priority. But suppose India wants to now start trading with the African countries, the entire Indian Ocean coast and that area is important, open, and there, are, there is so much of privacy. Uh, piracy. Similarly, if you look at you know uh, terrorism, Al Shabab is working there. Boko Haram is working in Western Africa and all other Al-Qaeda affiliates also are working. So somewhere handling terror, handling piracy uh, would be important from India's point of view because otherwise trade cannot begin. Already we have 70 billion trade but it is dwindling. So how will we promote trade? And that is a challenge we have to handle. As apart from you know, handling you know, security somewhere, uh, security and growth of all regions is also our priority. And, our Prime Minister visited Seychelles, Mauritius, Mozambique, Tanzania and all these areas and they are going to contribute because somewhere Indian is a very important between India and Africa. This particular partnership has to perhaps go on and India has been also supporting AU's efforts in bringing about security and India has supported UN missions as Ambassador Chabra mentioned that 5,000 forces have participated already in this particular area. I would also like to say one more thing that the youth to youth collaboration, India and Africa both have a large number of young people and how would we work out the kind of demographic dividend by kind of employing our youth, making them kind of stimulated into something which is creative between the two is also a challenge before us. I quite agree with Ambassador Virendra Gupta, you can't rely only on pan-African networks somewhere private initiative also is necessary in this area and how will it come we have to think of because of the set of years we are going to communicate only in the digitalized world and that has to be also addressed uh, very square last point that i thought i should make is concerning democracy at large i think democratization of world order uh, uh, ambassador ali talked about and as far as United Nations is concerned, so surely Security Council requires reforms, BRICS and G20 country kind of requires some admission. But democracy also is internal phenomena and somewhere what India and Africa can take from each other has to be also understood. Somewhere I feel in a very important area of democracies and India, for example, is a living democracy. Wonder that democracy has been among the world. India, India is a union of states. And somewhere it has also federalizing tendencies and they matter. And there are countries in Africa which are now going into democratic system. And interestingly, Ethiopia, South Africa and Nigeria, they are also working on federal lines. So how federalism can be strengthened, how federalism can be understood, how democratic governance can be understood, that can work out internally. Suppose you strengthen the bodies from local cell government to province to nation. I think democratic functioning goes on and more democratic functioning, more ideas come and less possibility of revolt, less possibility of tension. You can really silence guns with democracy. Africa has had very bitter experiences because of civil war, military dictatorships, uh, secessionist movements, and only democracy can allow you that 
leisure to kind of get through and how we we'll function democratically, strengthen democracy first within our respective countries, then between India and Africa and within the larger international politics in the world. All these are problems which we need to address. I think I have taken sufficient time. Financial resources are winding down as you know, one is looking at world economy and still when can a man gets out to work and one thinks of COVID crisis subside, which is a liberal, we would have learned a lesson from this. One, there is one world in which we have to fight and in this one world we have to get together and see that international organizations are strengthened. Self-reliance doesn't mean that we are isolating and autarchic, but we are kind of giving something of our own to poorer countries, giving them duty-free kind of concessions, least developed countries also would require support from India and at the same time take something out of them like our energy requirements are there with Africa and India has already, Nigeria, Angola and uh, Sudan, where India is collaborating in the energy sector. So the energy hungry economy of India is stimulated. India can also take a generous position, stimulate kind of different things in Africa where markets meet, people meet and also there is a good treatment to Africans at by and large. And that point which Dr. Virendra Gupta Sahib made, that the African students have to be treated also with respect in India. Many of our, many of students from Africa like Oba Sanjo, Buhari, they went back to Nigeria and headed the state. So we have to understand that when African students and 50,000 students are scholarship here, if they, they treat them properly, they will be ambassadors of India to Africa. And that's how partnerships can be built up. People to people relationships can be built up. I think I have spoken enough. Thanks ever so much for giving me the floor. And I'm sure questions will be there. I'll be ready to answer them. Thank you ever so much, Manishji. Uh, thanks, Professor Harshi, uh, for, those, for that excellent presentation. I now move on to uh, Ambassador of Mali, His Excellency Sekou Khase. Uh, Excellency, uh, coming back to, you know, my I, I traveled to Mali a couple of years ago and I found it a fascinating, very vibrant city, Bamako. Uh, also, I hear that uh, Mali became one of the first African country probably to hold some sort of parliamentary elections uh, after the pandemic erupted. Uh, my question to you uh, essentially is that if you could talk about, you know, uh, briefly about how Mali is handling uh, the, the pandemic. Also, you know, I have uh, uh, some questions from the panelists. I thought it would be a good opportunity to, to address this, a couple of questions, general questions, which is that how do you look at uh, the role of external powers like, uh, you know, uh, external players like China and India in addressing the crisis Bali and Africa is facing. Very briefly, you have seven minutes. I'll have to be ruthless now. We're really running out of time. Thanks. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, moderator. Uh, distinguished delegate, I would like to, to congratulate His Excellency uh, Shabab Shabab for his appointment and assure him my full cooperation. I would also like to express the deep gratitude of the government of the Republic of Mali to the government of the Republic of India for his uh, invaluable support in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic in my country. Indeed, last week, the ambassador of the Republic of India in Mali, His Excellency Ajani Kumar, hands over first consignment of life-saving medicines to the Minister of Health and Social Affairs of the Republic of Mali. Honorable moderator, a lot have been said by the panelists, and I would like to focus quickly in three points. But first of all, I would like to echo the declaration made by His Excellency Shabar, and if it is possible to have his uh, the text of his intervention. On the first point, India has been close to Africa at, from the beginning of the pandemic. I just mentioned the case of Mali. In addition of this uh, ad hoc medicine assistance, I think that India should more contribute in the implementation of the African response COVID-19, but also with African states. 
I also think that India could pull its skill in the fields of medicine and new technology to help African countries to better fight the COVID-19, but also over pandemic like malaria, AIDS, Ebola. Finally, India could help African countries in building health infrastructure, ranging from large hospital to field hospital. And you, you understand that all these areas of cooperation are set out in the guidance principles issued by the Honorable Prime Minister of India, His Excellency Narendra Modi. Now, it's time to put into action the various commitments made in the framework of India-Africa partnership. My second point, I will say yes, India and Exim Bank should continue to play an important role in the post-pandemic economic recovery, but also in the construction of Africa. In close cooperation with African Union, at the, but also at the regional and bilateral level. I would like to take this opportunity to express the gratitude of my government to the government of India and to Exim Bank for supporting my country in the field of the development. However, I would like to launch an appeal to Exim Bank to grant specific treatment to the landlocked African countries, particularly landlocked countries which face terrorism. West country with fragile economy are struck by the lack of maritime facet and by the presence of terrorists on the territory and today by the COVID-19. Exim Bank could ask me what specific treatment we need. I will respond by lowering the current interest rate and any other measures that will help as unlocked countries to recover economically. Exim Bank can also help African countries in the area of the capacity building, particularly on the field of the presentation of development projects. Honorable moderator, my last point will be the issue of the reform of multilateralism. I would like here to express satisfaction and the support of the government of the Republic of Mali to the candidature of India as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council next year. I personally sat at the Council Security table when my country was non-permanent member in 2000-2001. I'm also a former ambassador Hello. Yes, you are not hearing me? Hello, Excellency. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I said what I'm also a former uh, ambassador to UN in 2013-2016. Uh, and I wanted also to remind that since 2013, Mali has hosted the peacekeeping operation MINUSMA. So for me to see friendly country like India, the Security Council is good news and an asset in the process of reforming the major organ of the United Nations system. India and Africa together can contribute to the democratization of the international system. Together, India and Africa can also play an important role in the process of reforming some major organ like the Security Council, like the Human Rights Council, and double WHO. In this regard, I think that India and Africa could establish a framework for political consultation on the reform of the multilateralism. Framework can be set up with African Union, but also through bilateral political consultation. I also think that during the coming mandate of India at the Security Council, the delegation of India and the delegation of African countries, non-permanent member of the Security Council, must work hand in hand to address the issue of reform, but 
to to work also to make the peacekeeping operation more effective in the time of the protection of civilians. I would like to stop here and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Excellency. I'm sorry to be in, interrupting you and uh, concluding your very illuminating presentation. Now I uh, thank so much. Uh, now I invite last but not the least the last speaker. Uh, someone has to be. So, uh, yes, uh, may I invite my friend and uh, Pranav Kumar. He is uh, head of international trade. He handles international trade issues. AII. He's been also very proactive uh, with, you know, India-Africa engagement, economic engagement. His bio has already been circulated. So now I uh, ask Pranav to speak about, uh, to look ahead and talk about two issues which may have been bothering a lot of people, actually. That to talk about everything else is fine, but what about trade and investment? Uh, which needs a uh, stable, uh, positive environment, you know. And right now, we're living through very despairing, distressing times. Uh, investment, as they say, is an act of faith. So how do you, uh, going forward, how do you see uh, economic partnership between India and Africa going in these pandemic times and beyond? And you may briefly like to touch on the African continental uh, uh, free trade area and uh, what role it can play transforming fortunes of the continent. Over to you, Bruno. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Manish. Uh, after listening to all the eminent panelists, uh, very little uh, I could add at this point of time, but since you raised the issue of uh, continental fit area, Africa, and, and given the current uh, uncertain situation because of pandemic, uh, outbreak of pandemic, how we can move forward. So, uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Raul Chawla initially, he already uh, listed the, the, what all new issues uh, and new areas where India and Africa can incorporate. And if you see the list of it, like solar energy, bridging digital divide, traditional medicines, blue economy, triangular cooperation, again, is very important. Study in India, uh, and we are hugely dependent. We want more African students to come to India. Women empowerment, four, fourth industrial revolutions, all these are very important subjects uh, where India and Indian private sector can cooperate and collaborate with African continent, African nations. Now, uh, coming to your question on uh, uh, continental free trade of Africa, how it can uh, uh, help uh, galvanize or expedite uh, India Africa cooperation in trade and investment. Before uh, uh, taking up this issue, let me just uh, give a broader perspective. If you look at the current global scenario, uh, uh, all over we are seeing disruption. The disruption, of course, not only because of pandemic. Uh, pandemic, in fact, it has further exaggerated and magnified the uh, uh, disruption. But before that, we have witnessed the big trade war involving the US and China that has been big impact uh, globally because invariably, most of the countries, uh, uh, either your biggest trading partner is US or your biggest trading partner is China. So it, this has uh, brought big disruption in the global economy. Uh, Europe, you know that uh, uh, for the last uh, three, four years, because of the Brexit and all, again, was in a turmoil. Uh, within Asia-Pacific, we were negotiating the big uh, continental uh, or big trade agreement like the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, uh, but again, India at the last moment decided uh, to uh, not to completely withdraw, but of course wait for more time to uh, see if we can come back to the RCEP fold. So uh, from North America to Europe to Asia Pacific, we have uh, witnessed a signif significant amount of uh, disruption. And that has really uh, impacted the mood of the business because business uh, planning and business strategy depends upon the uh, certainty, some kind of predictability. And if you compare with the African continent situation, Africa also witnessed disruption, but more in the positive in nature. Uh, Agenda 2060, already we know, that's a very visionary and, and, uh, and long-term uh, agenda for the African continent. Uh, and more importantly, the big initiative by African, 55 African nations to integrate the African economy. That's a big step forward in spite of the various challenges we know. 
but they went ahead uh, they signed the agreement in 2018 so it's almost more than one half year they are going ahead and now they are planning to go into second phase of negotiations and that will definitely uh, have big impact on african engagement with the rest of the world because if you see the uh, 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 africa as a continent uh, uh, the intra africa trade is very minimal very low in comparison to intra intra regional trade in whether it's europe or america or asia you talk about so so africa depends upon other parts of the world both for investment and trade trade so if uh, this uh, continental free trade area of africa if this goes ahead and help in the integration of the african continent not only it will help help in intra africa trade but also help in ad, ad, attracting more investment from india and other parts of the world because if you uh, uh, see the major concern of uh, indian investment for instance uh, uh, because since the african market is not integrated individual african country is not big in terms of if you see the inv big investment has to go then of course investor investor would need a economy of a scale also so if even not continent wise even four or five uh, regional economies are also integrated that's a huge huge attractiveness for indian investment and investment from other parts of the world to go to africa so uh, so this is one area which is uh, we all are eagerly looking for in fact ambassador chavra also mentioned about that indian corporate circle has to be sensitized more about uh, the progress which african continent african countries are making uh, slowly but in very positive direction about the integration of the global economy and that will have a huge impact and positive impact on the mood of the indian businesses to look forward to african continent uh, second issue is uh, uh, again uh, we somebody mentioned about the, the duty free tariff preference scheme which india announced in 2018 2008 at the first india africa forum summit and later on it was uh, is scaled up and and the current coverage is more than 98.4% uh, more than 98% duty free but if you see the impact of duty free tariff preference scheme on the actual uh, export from african countries to african means uh, though this uh, uh, agreement is only for the african ldcs but they are big in number there are 34 35 african ldcs but we haven't seen much uh, increase in the export from africa to india and of course there are regions behind it and except tanzania and couple of other countries they have not been able to increase their export to india so uh, in fact we have been doing some work on that we cii has partnered with international trade center geneva they have a big project on the duty free tariff preference and also they are trying to see how indian investment can go so at that time we as a cii we interacted with many african uh, uh, diplomats african uh, private sector leaders and all uh, their common concern was look uh, uh, africa as a continent and particular this is they have a duty free access all over the world if they want to export to europe they have eba they want to export to uh, america they have a african growth and opportunity act uh, china has given duty free access japan has given duty free access india has given duty free access to as far as market access is concerned they have no problem but they need uh, what they will export they need more investment to enhance their Uh, productive capacity manufacturing capability then they would be able to export more to uh, uh, all uh, to india and other parts of the world so the major uh, factor here is how we can help increase our investment into africa enhance the manufacturing capability and that is what is needed today and we think that uh, continental free trade area, area of africa that we will be a big big stimulator on that front thank you very much uh thank you pranav uh, for mapping the way forward for economic relations to go forward ladies and gentlemen uh we have already crossed uh, believe it or not we uh, we started at 11:30 and we are now getting to 2 o'clock two and a half hour of discussion and i see a uh, very committed africanist still in the audience it is a tribute uh, to the to the Uh, the, the speakers, the, the the range of ideas that have cropped up, and the and the spirit of discussion. Uh, so we have finally come. All the speakers have many questions, which is which just shows the kind of interest uh, uh, this uh, conference, this webinar has generated. Uh, 
I'm going to be posing uh, the questions on behalf of the uh, uh, behalf of the participants. Some of them have already sent in their questions, and uh, let me start with a question that is posed to uh, Mr. Rahul Chabra. Ambassador Anil Vadhwa. Uh, ambassador Anil Vadhwa, he asked, uh, former ambassador, he was the former ambassador in the Ministry of Affairs, that uh, essentially, uh, that in the post COVID situation, uh, how does India see, you know, basically the budgeting and financing issues for the Africa related projects? Uh, the thrust is that uh, when the pandemic, which is also an economic crisis, affect uh, India's uh, financial commitment. You can hear me, Rahul? Can you hear the question? Hello? Hello? Really, uh, yeah, I couldn't really hear the question. You were getting cut off all the time. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, I ask you again. This question uh, is from. Yeah. Ambassador Anil Vadova, uh, India yeah, yeah. to Italy and many other countries. Yeah. Uh, he asked, is a, is, is a law, is phrased long uh, in a very interesting, but uh, basically the thrust of his question is, is that the pandemic, which is also brought in a full blown economic crisis, uh, will it impact, uh, will it impact uh, India's financial commitment, uh, uh, the kind of commitment we have made to Africa, pro India, India aided projects in Africa or otherwise, do you think it will diminish our capacity to advance the uh, development cooperation with Africa? Uh, I think uh, basically it's too early to say at the moment, of course, any commitments we have made, I mean, as you're aware, I think most of the panelists and the attendees are aware that uh, India has never gone back on any commitment. Uh, so if you've made a commitment, the commitment will be met. Uh, regarding new commitments, of course, that's a function of uh, the resources available. Uh, so if there is really a drastic fall and the economy does contract, which doesn't seem like with today's news about air services beginning and, you know, the uh, country opening up. So I hope that we will be at least uh, able to maintain uh, the levels that uh, we have been over the last few years. There may not be a big increase, but I'm sure we'll be able to try and uh, retain. But we might need to change the model. I mean, uh, the financing model. Uh, whether it will be completely public sector led, uh, will there be an element of public private partnership? You know, we could uh, look, think about uh, different innovative ways of financing uh, and looking at different uh, ways. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, comes from uh, this question is from Ruchita Berry. She is a research scholar, senior fellow with IDSA. Uh, she worked a lot in Africa. Uh, this question is for Ambassador Anil Suplal. Uh, uh, she asked that given the current paralysis within the United Nations, what are objectives of South Africa as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council? Can you hear me? Well, yeah. yes, yes. No, thank you for that question. I think it's an important question. As I indicated, this year is a seminal year to look at reform of the United Nations, including the Security Council. Prime Minister Modi has spoken extensively about a reform multilateralism. And the frustration is the slow pace uh, of work of the intergovernmental negotiations uh, within the UN system. And that's partly because there's a reluctance by a number of key countries, including the current, uh, some of the current permanent members, to see any reform taking place. Now, Africa is very clear, and South Africa is very clear, we want a reform of the Security Council and it's long uh, overdue. As I indicated, in 1945, when the UN was formed, most of Africa was not present at the table because we were still under colonial rule. When the first reform took place in 1963, we were represented there as Africa by a few countries, but in a weak position. Today, you have a united Africa, you have a common position in terms of Security Council reform, the Zulwini consensus. Many hide behind this saying that this is not a viable position, but Africa believes it's a viable position. We have a committee of C10, uh, African heads of state and government that uh, have been chosen by the AU to lead on this process. So I think India and South uh, Africa as a whole and South Africa being on the UNSC uh, 
this year should push for reform uh, of the Security Council at the 75th anniversary of the UN. Probably we're not going to have a physical meeting as uh, UNSG has pointed out. But I think we need to push this at the top of the agenda. The current world environment, the current global architecture is not representative of the new reality. We can't be stuck into, in the world of 1945 in 2020. And re unless we reform the multilateral institutions, including the Security Council, it will become more and more irrelevant in addressing peace and security and the global challenges. And we have seen this uh, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, where the world has failed to act in terms of, of having a pause in terms of conflict and having a collective, collective action. In instead of reinforcing the World Health Organization, we have seen some are using this uh, as an excuse to, to find fault with the way the WHO has been handling the pandemic. So I think it shows that the, there are serious fault lines in the multilateral system, the Security Council included, and it's long overdue if we want it to be relevant and to address the challenges of the times. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for uh, actually all panelists, but uh, I would like some uh, one, ambassadors from one of African countries, maybe uh, uh, Ambassador of Morocco, Uganda, to address this question. This question. From Ambu uh, says, are governments across Africa using this pandemic to push through important structural reforms like India has done to introduce labor and agricultural market reforms, which will allow African countries to move up the ease of doing business? Can essentially see what it means? Uh, uh, Ambassador of Uganda, would you uh, be interested in taking this question? That how governments across I can't really, I, I did not, I did not get structural reform. No, uh, uh, basically what, uh, what he's asking is that how governments across Africa can use this pandemic as an opportunity to advance much needed structural economic reforms. Say for example, uh, what India has done, the latest economic package announced by the Indian government, you know, uh, overall about land reforms, about uh, labor. Let me try, and then my brother, reforms. the ambassador of Morocco, uh, ambassador Morocco, uh, baby, uh, one of the ambassadors. Ambassador Morocco, would you like to take this question, sir? <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Yeah. I I said uh, before in my 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 small intervention that the this pandemic is a constitutional opportunity. It's a real chance for all of us to rethink our development. So I think if I start from my own point of view, from my own country, I believe that we have. Uh, uh, take uh, taking the lead into making our needs locally of the most of medical equipment that we are in need to combat uh, this uh, this pandemic. But maybe I would like to touch upon there is also another question. There, it's in fact the silence in the guns would always go through development, through securing jobs, through finding. Uh, giving the youth some uh, hope and then optimism. There are two elements also I, sh I want to share with the, with the people because when we think of India, Africa, we always think of getting from India towards Africa. I want to say to the, my colleagues in the panelists that the largest investment of public investment of Morocco in all Asia exists in, in India and it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, basically in the uh, fertilizer sectors. So I think uh, Morocco has contributed a great deal to ensuring food security to many countries, and then, and then we were quite happy also to have helped uh, India in reaching its food security. We have also some private investments in pharmaceuticals. So I think joint investments exist. So let us think of developing them into joint initiatives to help few countries and then including ourselves into developing. When it comes to, for instance, climate change, the question which uh, Manish asked me at the beginning, I think it's a success story. Uh, 
uh, in Morocco and then in the energy mix. Now we are producing 42% of our needs in energy from the renewables, either be it the uh, solar energy, while we have the largest plant in the world, or be it the hydro or wind energies. So I think there is there is a real opportunity, and I think we need to to create and then to help more development between the African countries themselves first, and then with the partners. Because sometimes we have this problem of absorption of loans, which we should also tackle. We have also this this capacity of or probably so many investments come for a single investment. We need to rationalize and then to, to look seriously into different, different partners throughout Africa and then uh, also in the political point of view, reform the multilateral systems. I think the more many African countries have at least the conviction now that they need to develop their own infrastructure, to develop their own, uh, their own economic developments. And then so many of them also have taken initiatives to help their agriculture sectors, to help the industries, because all of the people are affected, whatever the scale of the countries are. So the, the, the help is important according to the availability also on this, the, the importance of the economies in these countries. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Excellency. The next question is for uh, Mr. Rahul Chabra. Uh, Rahul, uh, this question is from Vijay Nayak, a senior Indian journalist. He is asking that, uh, you know, India and Africa, uh, the two sides have been talking about uh, some ambitious plans for blue economy. You are in Kenya out there, you know, what do you make out of, you know, the future of blue economy cooperation uh, between India and Africa? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, uh, it's one of the, as I mentioned, it's one of the new sectors uh, that is going to be focused upon. And uh, Kenya is putting a lot of emphasis on this uh, sector. Uh, they are, uh, they have a big coastline. Uh, they are looking at sort of monetizing the resources there. And uh, India is in an ideal position to collaborate with, it sort of fits in with our overall Indian Ocean strategy also because the coastline is the Indian Ocean. Uh, so there is a lot of scope. We need to sort of come into uh, concrete projects. Uh, but as of now, that is a sector that has been identified for future plans. Right. Thanks. Uh, the next question uh, uh, is for uh, AP Bank uh, Managing Director David Raskina. There are questions of, from various panel, various participants essentially on the line that uh, how can we utilize line of credit from Africa, for Africa, from India for agricultural inputs like fertilizers, uh, pesticides, mechanization of small and medium scale farming. Essentially, how can uh, lines of credit be leveraged to promote uh, this, uh, to further advance agricultural partnership and an issue that is will require greater importance in days to come, food security. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And the point is well taken. Food security is going to be a key issue for Africa going forward because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, however, the gentlemen or ladies who asked the question, uh, perhaps they're not fully informed because quite a few of the lines of credit are in fact extended for the agriculture sector. This could be by way of equipment right. like agri tractors or uh, uh, threshers, combined harvesters, uh, equipment for this. It could equally be by way of improvement of yield for the production of maize, cassava, rice. Senegal, for example, has been a very successful example where the yield of rice uh, cultivation has increased to a point where certain parts of the country are now fully self-sufficient in rice. So I su suggest uh, whoever asked the question, do take a look at some of the list of lines of credit on our website. You'll get an idea of where it is already being utilized. This is also for right. downstream. For example, it's not just cultivation. It could be the processing of tomatoes into tomato paste or mangoes into fruit pulp and so on. Remember right. also that the choice of project always is with that of the recipient government. Uh, right. I'm sure many participants would love to see that. The others may prefer other sectors, but it is the government in Africa uh, of that country which chooses what is the project it wishes to close. Uh, 
other is I'm clubbing a few questions because uh, especially on the lines. Let me just say something to that. Yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Excellency. Yeah. You know, um, I, I know that the Prime Minister uh, gave us guidance and said, um, what you will do depends on your priorities. But um, I, I really like to go back to that question of creativity with the money that's available by India to Africa. Now, uh, clearly, uh, the, the top executive of Exim Bank is going strictly by what the government of India has uh, told him. But I think that we have to, in this uh, post-COVID uh, uh, way of doing things, we have to re-examine how that money goes to Africa. This is something which has not been said by me, it's also been echoed by, I think Ethiopia said it and other African ambassadors have said it. We have to re-examine that because there are some, I know that there are some Indian companies and some Indian entrepreneurs who very much would like to go to Africa uh, and uh, do things in the lines that they are used to, their business in the lines of, of, of their expertise. They would like some funding to be able to do that because they rely on backup. But when they go to Africa, they find that there are no equivalent of um, uh, Exim banks in Africa. So when they ask for government guarantees, sometimes the government does not provide any money. When they ask for a little funding in the country which, has asked, which requires their project. For example, i give you a practical example. There is a cassava person who wanted to do uh, cassava into starch, cassava into liquids, cassava into pharmaceuticals and so on. And he wanted a little funding from uh, government X. And that money was not available in the government. But it was here. The same government had money which was available to it in Exim Bank, you know, and this, the result is that that money is caught between the two governments and it's not able to execute its projects. The other country, the country where the project is supposed to be executed, on the other hand, is losing out because it's not taking advantage of the Exim money. Really, we have to think through that, I think. The question is for Mr. Raul Chabra. Now, this question from Ambassador he says about what is the current status, how do you look at the potential of the much uh, talked about Africa-Asia growth origin? Is it still on our agenda? Where are we going? Uh, yes, uh, it was launched uh, a few years back, uh, but uh, as probably some of you are aware, uh, it's a completely a think tank-led initiative. So, uh, RIS on our side and a Japanese think tank on the other side. So, it really, uh, the government of India is uh, supportive. They're waiting for, if any movement has to take place, uh, it's really the think tank led initiative. So when they come up with ideas, proposals, we are ready to take it forward. Uh, next question, I'm, I'm combining uh, so many similar questions have been asked by a lot of panelists. And uh, I would really appreciate if uh, some ambassadors from African uh, countries uh, will address this, which is about, you know, uh, pandemic has also triggered a kind of uh, a geopolitical game, if I can put it like that, so, summing the spirit of questions being asked. As in, you know, uh, the competitive power play between major powers, major external players in Africa. And obviously, when we're talking about this, we're talk talking about this. China, of course, China rushing on, China being blamed, blamed by for the origin of for, for, uh, for the virus. Uh, with China going forward and essentially the world a very I mean you we don't understand that. We really touch on that what is Africa's strategy for engaging with the world balancing different players with their competitive agendas uh, who would like right. to and I, I, let me try and let's see whether my brothers from uh, uh, Morocco and uh, uh, Mali will uh, help me but I think that Africa's priorities have already been set out by Africa Agenda 2063. And that contains the aspirations of the continent on a wider, uh, a wider area, on security, and security, on uh, development, on uh, climate change, on every aspect. These are the issues which concern Africa now. Political rivalries as to the big powers. Are, we have seen big powers fighting before in Africa, for Africa. We have also seen where they have taken us. 
as Africa. Basically, they've left us in, in uh, sometimes in a worse state than we were before. And we have a new breed of leadership in Africa, which is looking more at the interest of Africa, more than the interest of the big powers. And they can also analyze situations and see that this is a question of rivalry between the big powers, and we don't want to go there. Basically, Africa wants the best for itself from whoever is prepared to ally with us in the areas of our interest. It's time that Africa set the pace, and I think it is doing so. Ambassador of Ethiopia, would you like to address this question as well? Uh, Excellency, uh, Ambassador of Ethiopia to India, are you still around? Can I also come in on this? Ali, yes. Yeah, 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 you can. Yes, yes sir, uh, Ambassador Shukla, go ahead. I think, as you pointed out, there's been a lot of finger pointing. Uh, this virus is supposed to have created a level playing field and see how humanity comes together in addressing the challenges. Firstly, in saving lives, in sharing experience and working together. But unfortunately, some, some role players globally have used this virus to further create schisms between global powers. We don't want to see a return to a superpower status or one or two poles of power. We are very clear as Africa, we want a multipolar world. And we want to see an inclusive process where no one is left behind, no country is marginalized. But what is quite clear, and just last week, uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, echoed that we may be entering a new Cold World War, a new Cold War. We don't want another Cold War. We know the casualties of the last Cold War. It's always the poorest of the poor that suffers most. And we don't want to be caught up in a new power uh, equation where Africa is used as a stamping ground. Because Africa is the last frontier for development. And we are very certain we have put in place mechanisms since the formation of the AU, various mechanisms, including the African peer review mechanism, the Pan-African Parliament. We'd like to see a more equitable world order based on the realities of the current world. And definitely you will see a change paradigm. You will see a new paradigm in terms of how partnerships are going to be forged in future post-COVID, because COVID has exploited the fault lines in terms of a few countries trying to gravitate and hold power and marginalizing others. I think that, that era is over. We're going to see alliances forming on being formed on mutual benefit, alliances being re-examined in terms of what value they add to both parties rather than uh, being there just as handouts. Africa is very clear, we don't want handouts, we want partnerships, sustainable partnerships. So I think post-COVID you will see new alignments, new paradigms and new forms of how partnerships are going to be created. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Excellencies, participants, speakers, uh, I think we have to end this somewhere. We have had uh, a very rich discussion. There are so many questions that will probably take uh, uh, an entire day and, you know, uh, to address all that. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to be, I can see that we've been here uh, for almost, uh, we're touching three hours. Again, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an eloquent testimony to the richness of discussions. Uh, the sheer range of ideas that have been generated. Uh, thank you all for uh, your contribution. Uh, before I do the vote of thanks, uh, I mean, I was, uh, let me uh, also point out that all your suggestions and recommendations that emerged out of this, we'll be putting it out in the next edition might hopefully come up a book as well, uh, because it's really a very rich, uh, a very rich uh, layered discussion. Uh, I would also, of course, we have the recording of the entire conference, uh, but I would urge each speaker on the, and we, you'll hear from us in the form of some question which you've addressed, that if you wish to add on or, or you know, provide a written in the form of a book, uh, without long preambles, uh, you're most welcome to do so. Uh, so, uh, at the end of the conference now, it's basically for me to thank, uh, above all, uh, Rahul Chhabra, who has taken time off uh, from Nairobi.
and much before he takes charge, Mr. Probably is going to be doing that in the first week of June. Uh, he comes in here, he's going to have a busy time supervising evacuation flights and a lot of work. But Rahul, thank you so much for joining in, sharing your thoughts and connecting with the people you're going to be seeing more often as you come to Delhi and uh, travel around the world. Uh, thank you to each of the speaker. Uh, I can't thank you enough for really making it and for sticking out right till the end. I mean, it's exemplary tenacity, exemplary interest, and above all, to the very loyal, very dedicated audience, especially those who have hung on right till the end. So ladies and gentlemen, it's time to say goodbye. Do share your feedback. We will continue this. Uh, uh, I was going to ask Raul uh, one more question, but I think I'll restrain. Essentially, everybody's talking about the next summer. But with the uncertainty uh, spawned by the pandemic, I guess it's really difficult to uh, speak about that. Uh, let me just end with, uh, you know, uh, time we're talking about Africa Day, and we talk about it's time for Africa. I mean, you know, for all of us to really engage with Africa, it's always time for Africa. And the spirit of oneness, uh, which I spoke about right at the beginning, that beautiful poem, that spirit of solidarity, Darity is what uh, will carry us through. Uh, my last thought, you know, which is this, that uh, as we uh, gear up to face next few uh, weeks of lockdown and the related, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's still going to be a difficult time. We don't know how it's going to pan out. Different countries, different geographies are at different stages of the pandemic. But I end this with, uh, on a very hopeful note, by a poem, uh, from a uh, Ghana po uh, poet, Ama Nuama. And she says, uh, to you have no shoes to put on their feet, who are barely any food to eat, who believe in some unreal hope, still dare to dream wild and free. Dare to dream, ladies and gentlemen, this idea, art of dreaming, this uh, uh, of hoping despite uh, impossible and trying situation, is embedded in the DNA of India and Africa and will carry us through and will enable us to deepen the partnership. Thank you once again to, to all of you for joining this discussion, for enriching the discussion. I'm grateful to you. Thank you so much. We'll see you Thank once you. again. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.